meeting, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for joining us. We have a very full evening tonight. Before we begin, I do have an announcement. December 24th, Town Hall will be closed. At noon. At noon. Thank you. <laughs> and are there any resident comments? No? Okay. We're going to move in. We do have a pre special presentation tonight, uh, which is a presentation of a bicycle proposal. And uh, if you give us a few minutes, we're going to set up the whiteboard presentation. Yeah, we're going to bring it right over here. I'm Bill Harbison. I'm going to actually give you these handouts. For those of you at home, this is an interactive meeting. So it looks like it's 3D right now. So you have it from LCTV. All the latest technology happening in Little Middle High School. Thank you. And you'll want one. It'll have to go into the minutes. Thank you, sir. Well, you want to mark it. And I will move over to the side so the whiteboard will be presentable. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Mark gets set up, if you could just introduce yourself. I will. Absolutely. I will. I will. Absolutely. Let's see if we can get to something here. This may or may not. Yeah, that's Apple TV there. <laughs> no, it's not funny. Do you think we have the wrong? I don't have any. The folks at home got to be just. <laughs> yeah. And pins and needles. Yep. <laughs> You're looking at the barcode. Green <laughs> barcode right now. Yeah. I hope it's, I hope they run the old peacock in there on the TV, you know, <laughs> with the, with the two uh, feathers falling out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, at least it's you know pretty it's pictures. Pretty. Yeah. We bring it's you not nothing but the best here in Lima. The nothing pictures are not fine. Yeah. It's just yeah. original. That's it. It's HDMI. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it is. Why is it fine? That's what it's fine in there. Can you email it? Oh, to Richard. Email it to my government account. I'll bring it up on Apple. Yeah. What? Let me see. Yes. Well, I think Marie, we're not going to get this to happen right now. Could we get the presentation and then we'll post it on the website? You can. I think it was supposed to leave us a computer. Oh, sure. Do that one. You just uh, try emailing it to Rachel. I'll, I'll do that right now. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it looks like we're not going to have the whiteboard presentation. Where Richard's going to try to get it on his. But if you could start, and then we will post on the website. We had requested a. A computer to be here, but I guess IT did not get that done for us, so I'm sorry. There's, that's an active mic over there. So why don't you, right over there? Oh, yes, because the cameras are going to be able to focus on you there. Mm -hmm. um, so my name is Dr. William Harbison, and um, I'm a cardiologist. I've been in practice here uh, in, cardi in cardiology in Long Meadow and Springfield since 1977. And uh, I'm an avid bike rider. I'm not a, a crazy bike rider. I don't bike 50, 100 miles a day, but I like to bike. And um, my wife likes to bike, and we both uh, ride recumbent bikes, just to let you know. So if you ever see me around with my flag on the back, that's me. Um, I'm actually representing the transition group of Longmeadow, which I think maybe you've heard of. So it's a group that was formed two or three years ago with the purpose in mind of, of trying to transform Long Meadow a little bit more into a green community. And um, as part of that, um, we 
I think you've uh, been involved with uh, the um, uh, recent work that Dave Miller has done trying to transition the community to a green uh, community status. Um, we've also been working on uh, plastic bottles. Um, but one of our focuses has been to try to get people to use less automobiles, um, walk more, bike more, not just for enjoyment, but for you know, routine um, chores and tasks, like going to Big Y or to, uh, um, you know, Moe's hardware store. Or, as I said in my letter, I actually picked up a, our 17-pound turkey on, on uh, Thanksgiving and put it on the back of my bike and took it over. Little things that can be done within about a mile or two, because nobody lives more than about two miles, really, from central location. Um, and, and it's not like we want to turn it into Amsterdam because, of course, in Amsterdam, everybody bikes. But we wanted to encourage biking. And, you know, talking to my friends who are really not avid bikers, it seems like the Long Meadow has got a little bit of a bad reputation for biking. And I, I have that a little bit of a difficulty understanding that because I personally think that Long Meadow is fairly friendly for biking. We do have sidewalks everywhere. We have fairly wide streets. Um, but I think there's people who say, well, I would never bike on Long Meadow Street, or I would never bike on Shaker Road, or I would never do this, or never do that, and never even consider going and running an errand on a bike. And so uh, my thought was that there are ways that we could, we could make Long Meadow a more bike-friendly community so that people could um, not only just enjoy biking, but actually use their bikes, you know, to reduce their use of oil, reduce their use of... Uh, the cars and, and um, you know, secondarily improve our, our climate change issues. So, um, so some of the things that I've come across is that um, we have no bike uh, lanes in our town as, a, as distinct from bike paths. We have no bike lanes. Um, we have no share the road signs in Long Meadow. And we have no, uh, there are many roads that do not have what we call striped shoulders. And I do have a map, which actually, we have the presentation now, which is good. Um, oh, thank you, um, Richard. You, that's great. Um, you want to just press the button, or you want me to do it? Or? Well, it's uh, I'll move over um, so they. Just part of so, that's, yeah, that's good. So, so basically, I'm saying we. Yeah, yeah I can just. Finger. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so, Ed, so we have no bike paths, no share the road signs, few striped or painted shoulders, and therefore, there's minimal bike use as a consequence. Um, so we do, however, have several attributes, and one of which is that our town planners many, many years ago did have a good vision in that they, they did um, set up several major main roads which connecting to a central point, which is uh, actually the big Y area and the high school. And I have a map later we can review. But um, in each of those roads, there's, there's multiple access from very safe biking side streets to each of these roads. So there's really very good um, uh, access to, uh, to, to everything here in Long Meadow, um, but we just need to <coughs> improve the safety, I think. Um, we're very fortunate also to have sidewalks on most roads. And I did check with the police department, and they said the sidewalks are open to everybody. There's no, I, I had actually thought that there was some sort of restriction that, that uh, adults were not supposed to ride bikes on sidewalks, but it turns out anybody can ride a bike on the sidewalk. Um, if you're a bike rider, you don't ride on a sidewalk. It's, it's kind of dangerous, but for the children in town, it's certainly a great way to get to school. Um, and I, I should also mention that um, we really would like to encourage the children in the town, the kids in the town, to do more biking to school. Um, and I did, uh, on several occasions, I've been over to Long Meadow High School, and I've counted the number of cars in the parking lot, and I've come up with 230, 240 cars, uh, and maybe two or three bikes. And, uh, which is <coughs> interesting, because I, I, I have kids who've gone through the system, and there's something about the high school where kids stop biking. I counted 60 or 70 bikes at Williams Middle School, but hardly any bikes at the high school. And, you know, the parents come up with lots of different reasons for that. Their kids are busy, their kids got too many books, they've got after-school sports, and, and maybe there are issues, but 
it seems to me that um, in a town this small, where we only have two or three miles to get to school, we should be able to improve on that. Um, so our recommendations are to put in bike lanes in a few areas, and I, I've targeted a few areas, um, which I've listed uh, in the back there. I don't know if you want to turn around or, or you can see it on your computers. Okay, fine. Um, first, and the most obvious one is is on Laurel Street, which you can actually go from from Ardsley Road to Converse. Um, it's it's about a mile, and it's a very wide road. It's a very heavily traveled road. People drive on that road extremely fast, um, and they race from light to light. We've had multiple accidents actually on my corner of Farmington Road and uh, Laurel Street. Is it Laurel Street or Laurel Road? <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. Um, and um, one thing that bike lanes do is they, they naturally will slow down traffic so that in addition to having a nice bike lane for bikers, which would be well marked, it is going to slow down traffic. So, so the, the, the major recommendation would be from Laurel. Another place which I've targeted, which is wide enough for a bike lane, and I should mention that you need uh, five feet legally for a bike lane when there is no when there is uh, no curb, excuse me, when there is a curb, and four feet when there is no curb, okay? So, uh, but however, Maple Road uh, from Long Meadow Street uh, east-west all the way to uh, Shaker Road is a nice place to target for a, a nice bike lane. Also, Hazardville Road, which connects to Shaker, and then I also targeted Frank Smith, which is possible but uh, it does have a curb and it, it, it may not be adequate for a bike lane. It may have to have what we call a striped corner. And so if you turn to the map, you will see um, where I've listed the bike lanes, which basically uh, is Laurel Street. Uh, these are the, the ones in the, on the top there, which are the, the dotted red. I um, had my son help me with this. and when he did it and originally it was blue and pink and I'm partially colorblind so I said can you just redo it because I can't really see anyway so the red are the bike lanes which I've targeted which are Hazardville Road um, Maple Road but most importantly would be Laurel's Laurel um, and uh, I do have the mileages listed uh, later is there any questions on that so far Bike lanes would be, um, this is a picture of the bike lane they just put in in East Long Meadow on Plum Tree Road. This is sort of what it looks like with a uh, stencil, which are pretty cheap to, to, to paint in there. They, they all come, you know, pre, pre stencil and you just paint over them. I don't know how much it costs to actually paint the lines, um, but, the, but the, the stencils are, are pretty cheap. So that's, they just put in a uh, one mile bike lane over in Plum Tree Road. Um, and I think they have plans for some more. And Amherst and Northampton all have bike lanes in various different places. Um, and this would be sort of what some of the signs would look like. And then our second recommendation is f um, to have some additional painted shoulders. And again, we can review the map, but um, I think you would know what a painted shoulder is. Basically, it's, you, know, you have a center stripe and then you have a white shoulder marking along the side of the road. And we have, we have roads in Long Meadow that, that, that have the, shoulders, the, the shoulder stripes, um, yet we have roads that don't. And so where I'm proposing that we put additional um, striped shoulders would be on Bliss Road, William Street, Wolf Swamp, and Frank Smith. And again, on the map, I can show you um, that, it, I don't know, can I go up to the board and just, uh, um, just for a second? Because um, where, where you have, um, for instance, if you're going um, east to west, if you start at the town line on Wolf Swamp, you have a nice painted shoulder all the way till when you get to Wolf Swamp. But from Wolf Swamp to Shaker Road, there's no painted shoulder. 
There's a beautiful painted shoulder on Shaker Road. There's a beautiful painted shoulder on William Street from the town line. But there's no painted shoulder on Bliss or on William Street. But there is a painted shoulder on William Street from the first church to the junction of Laurel. So, so I've targeted these areas here for painted shoulders. And then coincident with the painted shoulders, you're going to want to have, since these are not legal bike lanes, you're going to want to have um, share the road signs, which are sort of what we have here. And, and you can see that um, I've also, on the map, targeted these particular areas for share the road signs, which would be basically where you would have the painted shoulders. So you'd have a share the road sign as you're coming in from East Long, from East Long Meadow, uh, and that's over there by Hasbro. There'd be a share the road sign. There'd be a share of the road sign at the junction of Frank Smith going going west. There'd be a share of the road sign on on Wolf Swamp going east. There'd be a share of the road sign on Shaker from the town line. Be a share of the road sign on Shaker going down this way. So this is a painted, uh, this is a striped shoulder. And there'd be share of the road signs on um, Bliss at the corner of Long Meadow Street and uh, on Williams at the corner at the first church, but after the first church. Share the road signs coming into Long Meadow on Williams Street uh, at the town line where uh, where uh, Dwight comes in. That's all striped shoulder, but but there's no share of the road sign. And again, another share of the road sign as we come down Bliss. So <coughs> that would be uh, in addition to having the striped shoulders put in. And um, in terms of the uh, distances, uh, Laurel Street is about one, the, the, uh, the bike lane on, War on Laurel Street would be about 1.15 miles. The bike lane on um, Maple Road is about almost 1.5 miles. And on Hazardville Road, it's, it's less than a half a mile. On the striped shoulders, you, you're talking Bliss Road. Um, uh, from Long Meadow Street to Long Meadow Shops is about a mile and a half. William Street, Laurel Street to Frank Smith is about 1.32. Uh, the total is about seven point or almost eight miles of, of uh, additional uh, painting. You know, basically painting either uh, bike lanes or striped shoulders. Um, and I think, you know, in conjunction with that, we, we, we need to promote bicycle safety. Now, this is something that, you know, the transition group is not really involved with, but um, just my experience as, as a bicyclist, I can tell you that it is definitely a two-way street that, um, well, I really shouldn't have said two-way street, but it's, it's basically, it, it, it involves two partners. It involves the bicyclist and it involves the educating the, uh, the, uh, the, the driver. And in terms of our bicyclists, I, I have seen people in Longmeadow uh, who are not visible, who are biking against the traffic, uh, who don't wear helmets, who, you, who don't wear yellow, you can't see them. They're, they bike in packs. Um, they don't obey traffic signs. They'll go across a red light. I mean, and uh, it's it's frankly scary. And they give bicyclers a bad name. By the same token, I think that cars need to be educated. And, and I think that most of the biking community now is pretty much aware of the fact that the, the our major concern uh, as bicyclists is people texting when they're driving. And I have um, you know personally witnessed uh, at the junction of the tennis courts there. Uh, 50% of the cars going by either on cell phones or texting. So I think the public needs to be educated about that. Um, and I, um, I, I think that we can make some significant improvements. And um, that is basically the end of my presentation. Well, thank you very much. I wanted to leave some time for questions.
Um, I'll, I'll start. I have a first question, sure. and that is, so is, is the concept that if we build it, more people will start using their bikes, or do you feel that your group will have to start promoting and try to encourage bike use? I think both. I think if you had a bike lane on uh, Laurel Street and Hatchetville Road and people and, and these share the road signs, I think people would realize that, you know, we're... <laughs> They, they, it's more amenable to biking. It's, it's, it's more safety. We're basically, as a community, we're trying to embrace this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I think that people would bike more. Um, I, I know people who bike their kids to school. Um, I know people who, who do all their grocery shopping on bikes. And I'm not saying we have to promote that for everybody. Um, and certainly in the wintertime, we're not going to be biking on icy roads. But, you know, uh, this is a beautiful community, and it's extremely accessible for biking. And, um, you know, in this age, day and age of d um, diminishing resources, and, and I think it's, it's something we should, as a town, be trying to promote. And I know when I first started uh, talking to people about biking, they were saying that some people actually do commute to Springfield on mm -hmm. their bike, but there's a problem with the bike paths not being continuous. Is your group looking at that we and talking to Springfield? We haven't really looked at that. There's a problem of getting access to the bike path because I think mm -hmm. you have to go over the interstate. I'm not sure exactly how that works. And then mm -hmm. it does uh, – I have not personally done it. Um, okay. I've, I've biked the other way through Springfield, and it, it's it's not particularly pleasant, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, going through Forest Park is great, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> once you get past Forest Park, you, you know, um, I've, I've done it a couple of times. So it, I don't think we're ever going to have a bike path that's going to go through the center of Springfield, mm -hmm. but it would be nice. Um, but I think just commuting around Long Meadow, just for doing chores, just <coughs> running quick errands, you know. I've gone and bought ice cream. Mm -hmm. Big wide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just you don't have to drive a car for that. You know, mm -hmm. drive a bike or a walk. I, we're not we're not saying you can't walk. And mm -hmm. you know, there's certainly people who I have seen walking with groceries and things, which I think is great. Um, and and that's fine too. And just, as I say, sidewalks are everywhere. <coughs> um, my son, my middle son, lives in Gilderland uh, near Albany, and they're. My, my granddaughter goes to kindergarten there. Uh, it's a mile and a half from their house. There's not a single sidewalk that they can take to get that kid from her house to the school. So she has to be bused. Now Longmeadow is very rich and in sidewalks. And we are sidewalks. very, very mm -hmm. good in that respect. Yeah. And I, you know, the kids can bike on the, on the sidewalks. They can walk on the sidewalks. We, we're very fortunate in that respect. So Any I think we have a lot questions? to- Any other questions? Alex? Well, I guess this is more of a comment than a question, but um, I, I just want to thank you for making this presentation. I can personally vouch for many of the things you say. I've ridden my bikes on, uh, on these very roads. Uh, some of them <coughs> do feel unsafe. Uh, I've gone down Bliss Road. Um, that's a little tight. Um, and I've taken my kids uh, biking to school. And I think it, it's just such a win, win, win all the way around. You're, you're promoting fitness for kids. You're promoting fitness for everybody. You're uh, getting cars off the road. You're reducing pollution. You're increasing the quality of life. Um, and I'd like to see us uh, follow up on this. We're really just talking about some paint uh, and some uh, labor behind it and some signs and I, I think this could have uh, you know definite um, payoffs in the future any other questions or comments Paul yeah, I'm gonna just address this to the board I, I first of all thank you for putting your time in um, I don't agree with you in a sense of um, I see this more as a political statement of trying to, um, of climate change and global warming and, and I really I have to say that in a town that has as many sidewalks as we have, that we just spent 25 minutes talking about this versus the biggest issue facing this board, which is the casino. And I, you know, this could have been done at maybe another time, but um, you know, painting lines on a road, <clears throat> putting signs up, which actually the signs will affect quality of life the more signs you have in town. Uh, there's even one that's in the middle of town now that has a, a speed thing on it. I don't know if that's temporary. seems like it's permanent on the island by Big Y. It was marking your speed. I don't know. It doesn't look like a temporary one. And I think it's ugly. 
and you know the more signs we put up in town the more signs the, the the more the quality of life is diminished i don't think we need bike paths i don't i think anecdotally is the presentation is anecdotal there's no evidence that if you have a bike path more people will ride with all the sidewalks we have i've ridden my bikes with my kids all over town to go to playgrounds to go to the to, to schools and uh, you know there's there's a reason why there's sidewalks and, and i think they're safe uh, if you're an avid bike rider and you and you want competition, you're not going to ride on the sidewalk. Just like there's runners that run in the road, um, and I actually see that that by doing this, you'll actually have more competitions with runners in your bike lanes than you will with um, other people biking or cars. So, I just I, I really think that you know before we say it's just paint and it's just some signs that you really think about this because there was a street that we put a sign on that said that and you made a comment that you know bike lanes will reduce traffic and. Um, I don't know. It got. It had to be about four. Were you on the board, Mark? On Green Acre, oh, yeah. we painted a yellow line down Green Acre to slow down traffic, and it was the biggest uproar that we had as a board for about three months, um, because people were upset that there was a, a a yellow line painted down their road, and um, before, like I said, we just go and put stencils down and put signs up that there's a little bit more thought into this. I really think some of this is, and I wouldn't disagree if the, you know, if our, if our traffic committee or safety committee looked at it and said, <coughs> is it, is it a safety issue? Cause that I think would play more into whether we should do this or not, if there's a safety issue. And I think that might be the, the something to pass off to the traffic committee or safety committee. I'm saying, um, because I think the safety committee will tell us that yes, it's needed or no, it's not. And I, I think that would be the first step into uh, doing this rather than authorizing something. Well, I think it's the beginning of the conversation and I think it is actually apropos because right now we're talking about traffic. We're talking about the casinos and the effects and we're having traffic experts and this is the future and where we're going to be going as a town. And it's not something we're going to make a decision on right away, but I think it is something that needs to be part of the conversation going forward. So I really appreciate you going forward in some very thoughtful presentation. And uh, we're going to keep this in mind as we decide what we need to do with our roads to make them safer and um, decrease traffic if we get more people using their bikes in a safe way. Can I just respond mm -hmm. to what you're saying now, just, just for one, just mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't think you should encourage mm -hmm. people to be riding their bikes on the sidewalk. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think that that that's people are supposed to walk on the sidewalk. They're not mm -hmm. supposed to ride their bikes on the sidewalk. That's a, and actually, I don't know why people run the streets. They should be running on the <laughs> sidewalks. I mean, I see people running the streets. Yeah, you you figure that one out. You yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but but yeah. I, you know, I, it's, it's one thing to to bike your kids, mm -hmm. you know, on the on the sidewalk to school. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, if you're going out to run an errand, mm -hmm. um, you should be able. To, you should feel comfortable riding mm -hmm. in the street. To, to I see. I've, and I've I never felt threatened riding in Long Meadow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I think that uh, there that's are. That's just my opinion. Yeah. But I mean, you ask, You're saying what you feel. I feel. No, like we're I'm not going to. We're not many going to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're not going to decide that today. But no. we are moving forward, and yeah. I think it's a very important conversation you're beginning today. So thank you very much. Thank I you appreciate for the presentation. Me. I appreciate it. And mm -hmm. we'll make this part of the. Um, the minutes so it'll be yep. available up on the website also so if anyone wants to read further about the proposal it will sure. be available on the website thank you very much for your time thank you thank, All you. Right. thank you have a good evening you had asked him about what they're doing to promote bicycle safety a little oh, bit I forgot yes i don't know that he answered it completely mm -hmm. but i just want to oh just want to tell us who you are sorry <laughs> <laughs> we know who I'm you are but king, king pinewood drive mm -hmm. um I'm just speaking as an individual in the town, yes. not the school mm -hmm. committee. <laughs> um, uh -huh. I'm part of the transition group, and one of the things that we're trying to do to create bicycle awareness and mm -hmm. um, talk to the community about bicycle safety mm -hmm. is we um, are holding bike swaps once a year. Oh, wonderful. And we did it last mm -hmm. year. Um, we had an enormous, tremendous mm -hmm. um, turnout. <coughs> um, we're going to do it again this year. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, th the things that we do at this bike swap is we hand out literature to everyone about bike safety. We have um, mm -hmm. people there with helmets promoting the idea of, of wearing helmets. Um, I actually personally have been working with um, Mass Safe Routes to School. Okay. And um, we've mm -hmm. been uh, promoting bike to school days, mm -hmm. walk to school days, and trying to talk to people about coming in to talk <coughs> to the schools about bike safety. Mm -hmm. Although I know that the police department got rid of their bike safety person <laughs> that <laughs> talks to the school. <laughs> so now we're trying to figure out how to fund something mm -hmm. like that in our school, um, at least the school at Blueberry. So well, let us know when that is. I will make the announcement here and we'll also put it up on the website. 
okay. so that um, not just the schools but everyone knows because as you said we want the adults yeah. enjoying the bicycle uh, yeah we have I mean, I saw people that were mm -hmm. at the bike swap that were mm -hmm. buying you know the, the trailers and mm -hmm. the things that they had and I saw them on the road when I was biking mm -hmm. later on in the summer and I thought oh this is fabulous so I think uh -huh. you know just talking about it within the community uh, creating more of an awareness it's kind of one I of the things we're doing. I should mention that, that it was Kim King who basically <laughs> engineered the entire bike stuff. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Well, that so would be great. Let us know when the next one is, and we'll get that word okay. out for you. Great. Okay, thank Thanks. you for coming. Um, now, select board comments. I've sort of put that up on the top since we have another presentation by Richard later. Any select board comments at this point? Uh, Mark? I, I, I don't know if it's select board comments or general mm -hmm. announcements, but I'd like to remind people at home that with the advent of snow season, the responsibility of homeowners to clear their sidewalks and the fire hydrants. I noted today that there's lots of fire hydrants that haven't been cleared, and uh, I assume that our code compliance group will start getting busy and <laughs> reminding people in sometimes gentle and sometimes not so gentle way about the requirement to mm -hmm. clear sidewalks. And, and I, I take the, I have 125 feet of sidewalk in front of my house, so I <laughs> so you know your I civic know duty. <laughs> where it's coming from. So. And there's another snow coming in Tuesday, yep. so you'll. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, before we start, Richard, do we want to vote the committee appointments? Mm -hmm. um, looking for a motion on the building demolition committee. For Sandra Crine. Fine, I'll make a, I'll make a motion to appoint Sandra Crine to the building demolition committee. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. I'll move to appoint John Taylor to the recycling commission. For uh, one year associate term. Uh, is there a second? Second. Um, a discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and we still have some um, vacancies on the uh, various committee and commissions. Please look at it, and we'd love to have you volunteer. Uh, motions I, for. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I didn't know we were done with select board comments. Oh, I'm I sorry. Know. I just <laughs> want to say, you know, we just had a presentation that took mm -hmm. a half an hour time, and not one single item of that presentation was in our packet. And I and I they did not I didn't know he was going to be handing it out and um, but there should be mm. some sort of protocol that said if we're going to be in consideration of an item or at least have it presented to us that we have it ahead of time um, and that is my that's my error because he did send me the presentation ahead uh, and I didn't even think of putting in the packet so I will do that next time Paul thank you uh, any other select board comments <coughs> no oh um, yes apropos of our so mm -hmm. that you do understand why people run in the roads, because I do run in the road. Softer. Uh, <coughs> that's right. Concrete is very hard on knees, mm -hmm. and uh, it and it's also much icier. Okay. Thank you. And I hope you wear your orange reflectors. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, now we'll move on to the minutes. Um, well, I is hope we approve the minutes of November 12, 2013, special meeting. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I mean, uh, we approve the minutes of November 18, 2013, regular select board meeting. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Approve. I move right, we approve. Did you? I, I'm just going to go down through no, the. No, I was just making sure he, was, he, yeah, he had voted. Oh. Okay. He's waving over there. I move we approve the <laughs> minutes of the November 25th, 2013, special select board meeting. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And finally, I'll move we approve the minutes of the regular December 2nd, 2013. Second. Uh, discussion? One correction. Oh, yes. Um, under infrastructure analysis and capital plan, and it said Mr. Santanola asked Mr. Crane to communicate with PVPC regarding priorities on community funds. I don't think I asked that. I think someone else did. I don't remember. But I, I don't think I asked that question about PVC priorities. Can you? Uh, PVPC. It's in the notes under infrastructure analysis and capital planning is the bolded heading. So it's after all of them. It's after we had our casino discussion with Attorney Moss, and the very next bolded category. Okay, it says. Um, There's two things. First, it said I, at the very bottom that I asked Mr. Crane to communicate with PVPC, and I don't. I just don't recall saying that. Okay, um, so you want to cross out where he says ask Mr. Crane to communicate with PV. PC regarding priorities on community funds. Okay, right, is there any um, discussion on that, or do we agree <coughs> to strike it? 
Agreed. Okay. Okay. And then the other correction I have is um, in the same category, about three lines up, it's in Mr. Santanel stated we needed to get away from the notion that we only spent 2% of capital. Um, and these, min these minutes are a little bit more cryptic. That there was the, the reason I said that is because we spent about 5% in capital over the last five years, and I like that noted in there. Okay, so we spent, we and spent, I remember you saying about right. 5%. So we spent closer to 5%. Correct, over the last few years. I just want to make, because that doesn't sound like it Any complaints anything. about or concerns sorry, about any? Where did Paul? Spent, right after spent 2% right. capital because we have spent <clears throat> roughly 5% per year for the last few years on capital. Is that true? Very no, much but so. that's what he said. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay, not that enough. I agree with the statement, but I agree that he did say that. I'll right. let them all mm -hmm. up with you. We'll, we'll figure it out <laughs> Yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> okay, so you want added, we have spent 5% for the last few, few years. Per year, correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And with those corrections, um, actually, I actually have one correction. I just okay. noted uh, there's a misspelling on Mr. Steger's name. He's he's S T E G E R. So with that correction. Okay. <coughs> and with those three corrections, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now we're up to Richard. Richard has yeah. been very patient. He had prepared this uh, actually last year and you made a presentation to the town and you've updated the information and um, you were supposed to do it the other week but we were very busy so thank you very much you want to give us okay. an analysis of the infrastructure here in Longmeadow okay and, and, uh, and I will move out of the way okay. again and turn down the lights uh, editorial correction actually Paul and I did this session last year at the senior center and then we it was filmed and it's been running on uh, LCTV on a some type of basis throughout the years. So there has been some comments back. This uh, this is, it's intended basically as an open, uh, more of an open dialogue and to review some of the information that we currently have that, and talk a little bit about how we incorporate it into one master program. Uh, this following, the, up on the, this, the uh, uh, whiteboard now, you'll see the studies that we actually have in the town and what years they were completed in. Uh, 2008, to 2012 roadway inventory updates are ongoing and the, the bottom line is this is not the whole picture of our needs because these were the only resources that were studied in any sort of detail and all of the facilities were not studied there was a select amount of studies uh, select amount of facilities that were included in the study the major resource groups in our community are buildings roads water systems sidewalks landscape features open space as you can see, these are the major resource groups that we have in our community. Buildings, one th the thing should be noted as a, uh, as a building ages, many components require replacement such as the heating systems, the roofs, uh, all the items that are uh, prone to wear and tear. And all structures have an estimated life cycle. At the end of the life cycle, you can either rebuild them or you may go ahead and rehabilitate them, depending on the type of structure and uh, what's inside, how complex it would be to to pull out all the infrastructure elements and replace it. Routine and preventative maintenance will ensure an adequate life cycle on a structure, and conversely, inadequate preventative maintenance will decrease the life cycle, life cycle on a structure considerably. On our resource group on roads, we have three basic forms of maintenance and repair work that we do on a road system. We have routine, preventative, and rehabilitation. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to describe the three <coughs> types with a slide presentation so we can graphically see what they are. This is, this is a routine road maintenance situation here. This is called crack sealing. Now, the cracks in the road bed is, is a normal occurrence. After four, five, six years, you will start, the asphalt bed dries out. You will get cracks just like you'd get on your driveway in your home. Uh, to prevent moisture from entering the substrate, we seal these cracks. And you can see here this, this sealant had been put down and the crack has, re, has reoccurred or this picture may have been taken when it was very cold and the roadbed was shrunk so the, the crack had opened up again. There's all types of sealant. Some are, some are excellent and some are practically worthless. This particular one I, I wouldn't recommend. There, there's not enough sealant. This more looks along like black paint that was put down. But if, if you've drove into through our town, you've noticed some of the... Uh, some of the road stripe or some of the crack fill material is pretty thick, so it seals and it seals the water out of the bed 
uh, very well. It's a very, very important part of maintenance or preventative maintenance on a road system is to keep the water out of the substrate. Preventative road maintenance. Now, we, we stepped it up quite a bit. Now, you, this is a section of road that was over on uh, Dwight. And you'll notice that we've got various different crack patterns showing on this road. This road displays evidence that we did not do preventative maintenance uh, because we can't see any crack sealing any place on it. And, and this has moved a little. This is on the upper edges of preventative maintenance because we have sections of this roadbed now specifically through here is where the wheel paths are. That for, we'll actually need to be pulled out and, and do a full depth reconstruction to get a proper road base back in. You notice on the side of the road we have erosion problems here and likely general drainage problems throughout the roadbed. Um, <clears throat> normally if you can catch a road just prior to this, you do a mill and overlay and you preserve the road. But this one is very, very close to moving into the rehabilitation zone. What was the word you just used? Uh, which one? Preventative maintenance? Mill and overlay? Oh, mill and overlay. That is, that is to go in with a rotary mill and take two inches of asphalt off and put two inches of new asphalt back on. If the, if, the under, if the under support structure on the road is sufficient, it's an excellent repair mechanism. As a matter of fact, it's what is recommended on a routine maintenance, or on a routine basis. But when you get too severe a cracking and the roadbed starts to uh, get these deep fissures and the deep, deep areas of, of, of distress, you, you have to actually physically cut out all the asphalt and build it back up. This is another section that was over on uh, Dwight Road. And you can see, just guessing, it looks like it's had five or six different asphalt layers put in there as patches and repairs over the year. Uh, you really don't need to investigate this too much. Uh, there's a lot of water on this roadbed. It's, it's been pumping water. It's, it's, a, it's one big pothole every year that reoccurs. Uh, you notice up, in the, up at the top in a road rehabilitation, I got the word sponge. If you, if you took a road cross section, you looked at it, you'd have asphalt on the top, and below that you would have all your base materials that build up the foundation of your road. Uh, you can consider the base material as a sponge. If it's dry, <coughs> it's very firm, and it'll hold a lot of weight. But once it gets wet or moisture in it, it starts to move, and when a heavy truck <coughs> goes across that roadbed and exceeds the, the uh, thickness level of stress, it will crack and push the, the materials down and it'll squoosh out to the side and consequently that's when you get cracks in your road bed. So moisture is the main problem here. Uh, it's a 100% moisture problem. Uh, the only repair on this is totally pull it out, redo the substrate, uh, put in proper drainage and put a new uh, four inch coat of asphalt on top and start over. The life cycle on the pavement is, is universal across our country. Uh, these graphs, there's all kinds of these graphs, and when you lay them side by side, they're almost identical, except for the dollar figures. That varies a little bit. Now, over on the uh, left-hand side, going uh, in your vertical, you have the condition of a pavement. It goes from failed all the way to excellent. And on the bottom, horizontal, you have the years of service. Now, across the top, as this curve starts down, you see the sawtooth pattern that takes effect. That sawtooth pattern is when we start milling and overlaying the asphalt to extend its life on out. If we fail to do the mill and overlays at that point, then it, the curve is going to slip and it's going to continue down this curve until it finally fails totally. You'll notice that on this chart, they're talking about preventative maintenance occurring at about 10 years. So somewhere between 10 and 11 years, they want to mill and overlay. And you'll notice that you get, you get short periods of time but the cost is not as great to do it at this point. Uh, I read a report that said the state of Georgia now has finished up a, I think a study started in 1987 where they, ha they have set an ideal mill and overlay uh, time period at 9.6 years. And that's, that's a pretty accelerated rate for a southern road system, but they've, uh, they've been playing around with a lot of different mill and overlays down there, and they figure that's an ideal time to get a road mill and overlay. If you don't do it, at that point it starts to cascade, and you'll notice that between about 10 years and out to about 15 years, you'll notice how much of a drop in quality is taking place. You'll notice this arrow here points to a point, uh, to a point in its uh, uh, age cycle that said at this point, you'll be six to $10 per the same unit of work that you would do at this point for $1. So if you look at the, look at the chart, if you don't do the preventative maintenance in this area, you go into this one. If you don't do this, you slide down into this. Once you're in this area here, you're talking about totally reconstructing the road. And, your, of course, your ride quality is terrible and your complaints and 
it, it just, it's just pothole after pothole. It, it's totally shot. Roadway design considerations. I've just put this up just for some simple discussion on it. Uh, traffic loading, heavy trucks, these are the design factors that go into uh, a road design. They call it easel ratings. That's equivalent single axle loadings. It's based, I believe, on an 18,000 pound semi. You have your soil substrate strength, your pavement uh, material characteristics. That's the strength of materials uh, composing the pavement buildup. You have environmental conditions. Like we have severe winters up here down south, you have a lot of sun, so you have a factors that will affect the pavement material strength. I think the point that needs to be brought out here is, has our usage changed since we constructed our roads in this town? Uh, most of our roads, I would say, are 15, 20 years old at this point. And I would say that we would, we would be hard pressed to say that our loading hasn't changed with the semi-traffic, especially coming down Converse, Longmeadow Street, uh, even down uh, at Williams. There's a lot of semi-tractor trailers coming through. Even when you notice the size of our fleet within our own town, we've increased the size of our fleet. We have the big sewage truck running out there. We have these enormous garbage trucks running our roads now that are much larger than they were 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the recent construction on Merriweather this year, uh, I, went, I looked at a cross section of the asphalt. There was one place up there where it was only two inches thick. So there was, there was no wonder why the road was breaking up. It, it was never built to take the loads that we're having today. Uh, minimum, you would, on a residential <coughs> street, on, mo on, on a good substrate, you'd have minimum four inches of asphalt. And that's pretty universal on that. And you could build up on lower and all them. You could get six, eight inches of asphalt with a, with a 12, 18 inch sub base. I mean, pretty substantial differences for the load factors. So I think this is one factor that's hurting us, especially uh, in our town now, is, is our, load, our, our loading and our truck usage and the, the general use on our roads has changed drastically since they were originally constructed. The roads, we have approximately 95.4 miles of roadways and 25% are arterial and 75 residential. Now I, I, I chose to use a, uh, a fairly um, conservative schedule on this. I said, well, we can take uh, arterial roads 10 to 12 years. And remember in Georgia, they're doing it 9.6. So I stretched ours 10 to 12, and I took our residential roads and stress, stretched them out to 10 to 15 years. Now this is for mill and overlays. So we would be, be doing preventative maintenance all along on the roads, but the mill and overlays would occur at this 10 to 12 if we could push it that far. Uh, standard mill and overlay right now is running somewhere between 250 to $300,000 per mile. And that does not include utility work. So that's just go in and do a mill and overlay, maybe a little shoulder repair, a little sidewalks here and there, but basically it's, it's not a great deal and it's certainly not full reconstruction. Based on the miles that we have in our town and this schedule, we would need to be uh, repairing approximately eight miles of roadways annually to keep up with the schedule as, as identified there. I personally don't think we're gonna get that good of a life cycle on it considering the, the conditions and considering some of the loading on our major roads, but time will tell. If, if we start getting the roads rebuilt properly, when we, when we go back and repave, we make sure the substrate's right and we build them up properly, then we'll, we'll start our own curves up here. But historically, uh, somewhere 10, 12 years, your asphalt's gonna break apart. Water systems. We have 99 miles of water lines of various sizes in our community. And just resource data, that's 5,700 meters and 1,100 fire hydrants. 35% of our systems lines are four and six inches. Now, the, the new codes, I don't wanna say code, most of the communities now will have eight inch lines for your fire main protection. You can have six inch lines because you can take the pressure up and you'll still have adequate protection. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you could get a situation uh, for proper fire protection with a four inch line unless you really crank the pressure up on it. Now you have other ways, you can tank water in, you can bypass water, but basically the four and six inch lines in our community, uh, as outlined in the report, we should be scheduling for replacement. Over the, over the years, water lines corrode and become blocked with mineral deposits. I think our director of public works has shown you some, some pieces of pipe that have been practically closed down by mineral deposits and, and build up. By the way, that's why we flush our fire hydrants uh, every year is to, to keep the deposits out of the line. When we open them up, it flushes a tremendous amount of water out and it carries these mineral deposits out of the lines. 
We have approximately 2.4 miles of 4-inch lines and 32 miles of 6-inch lines in our community. And obviously the rest of the miles is 8-inch lines. Since 2008, we have replaced 2.04 miles of the 6-inch water lines and 0 .06 miles of the 4-inch lines. At this rate of replacement, it will take us 80 years to replace all of our 6-inch lines and it will take us 181 years to do our 4-inch lines. And we still have 65 miles of 8-inch lines that need <coughs> periodic replacement, which we are actively replacing now. I think if you talk to the engineering department, they're, they are already replacing a lot of the 8-inch lines because they're having a problem. They were, our lines are made of a variety of different materials, so we're having uh, the transite lines especially are vulnerable to, uh, to breakage. Sewage system, 83 miles of sewage lines, 2,100 manholes. Most of our sewer lines are 50 plus years old. And folks, I don't need to say another thing. I've already told you the condition of our sewage system. 50 years old, they're made of a variety of pipes from terracotta to transite, everything you can imagine is under the ground as if the infrastructure was uh, installed over the years. Sewage lines are subject to root intrusion, misalignment, leakage, and groundwater infiltration. Uh, you remember we had Mike talk to us a couple of years ago when we were talking about the, the water meter readings down there and he mentioned that they had, when they started plotting them during heavy, heavy, heavy downpour events, he would see an increase in effluent. Well, everybody wasn't flushing their toilets at that time. It was groundwater, groundwater seeping into our sewage system and we were actually being billed for that as it was pumped away from our community. By the way, that, that's a normal occurrence. Every community in America has that problem. But it's, it's something that you deal with to correct because all of the communities have certain areas usually that are old and root infested like, like ours most likely is. So they're going to have problems. Um, replacing a mile a year would take 83 years to replace our system right now. And I don't know how much we replace and I didn't check with the engineering department to say how much has been replaced in the last couple of years. Drainage system. Drainage infrastructure requires a, co a continual amount of routine and preventative maintenance to have it functioning properly. And, and the reason for this is to prevent a catastrophic or uncontrolled discharge of stormwater. Stormwater can, can be a, an awesome force of nature when it comes down at you. Here's some typical failures that we've had in our town. This, is, this looks like about a 36 inch line, it may be a 28, but it looks like about 36. And you can see the amount of soil around that pipe that is eroded uh, during that period of time that it, it was flushing out into the area. All the erosion and sediment is, is transferred down to other drainage systems or in the worst case scenario into the Connecticut River. This is another failure. I believe this was one that was the Ely Way. Now this started, this headwall section was up in ground and this was the head wall and it started by a little water dripping down the edge of the head wall and undermining and then this piece fell off, this pipe fell off, that pipe fell off and here's the other one, it's still in the ground. All of this area of soil has been eroded by this drainage system. Now this problem has, has been fixed. I believe it came in at close to $400,000 to fix this problem. If we had caught this on day one or through a good preventative maintenance program, it never would have failed because we could have built up riprap at the end for a splash plate and, and controlled that water going down through. So, and the worst part about it, these drainage systems, they're very hard to see during the summer because the foliage comes in. The best time to inspect these is right now in the winter, especially if the ground doesn't have snow on it. You can see, if, you can see what's happening, that there's erosion and all in there. That's when you normally do a good drainage inspection. Of the physical structures, the best time to check your actual drainage is right in the middle of a downpour. This is an interesting shot. This is a likely 24 to 36 inch line and the inspector is standing on top of the line and you'll notice that this is silt. This line is totally blocked with silt and vegetation. So whatever water was coming out of this line has been diverted to some other location in our community. This is what happens when you don't have an adequate reoccurring inspection program is these will silt up. Now this silt may have actually been from one of those other failures that we talked about. Very easily could have come <coughs> from one of the other failures or from uh, roadside construction without silt barriers, uh, anything, all the residential runoffs, it, it, the silt goes into our drains. Organic matter being put into our drains. 
you know, I, I see a lot of uh, landscapers in town that spill the grass out on the roadways and don't pick it all up, and it flushes into our into our uh, uh, drainage system. Uh, th that's a violation of stormwater. You you cannot discharge anything into there. You can't even discharge chlorinated water into your drainage system, which you will see being done also. I, you're supposed to preserve the integrity of your drainage system and keep all organic matter out of it because this is what happens when organic matter gets into the drainage system. It can't flush out. This is a, a drop in that th this one was on William Street. And this has been fixed, by the way. But this was the state that it got in before it was fixed. Now, below, below this metal cage, there is a, a, a brick structure that goes down to the main drainage line. And what happens in these old brick structures is you get a slight depression in the road, and the traffic keeps popping down into these. And it will eventually pound them right down. All the mortar leaves the bricks, and they just collapse. And, and usually you don't get a catastrophic failure, but you just get a progressive failure of the whole assembly sinking down into the ground. Uh, you will notice in town that we've got a couple more that are pretty low that are being beat down, and they're, they're being progressively repaired and fixed. I, Mike will be hard-pressed to do them now that we're in the full-fledged winter, but when they redo a roadway, when you're doing all the drainage, they rebuild all of these and put, uh, put new concrete liners and all on them. Sidewalks. We have... 70 miles of sidewalks in our community. And we know they're used for recreation and there's explicit guidelines for the repair, et cetera. And, and I know we've had a lot of irritation about asphalt. And there's no doubt about it. Asphalt on a concrete sidewalk should only be used for temporary emergency repairs. It's, it's not intended for a permanent repair. It's temporary. Richard? Yes. Can I ask a question about yeah. Um, is concrete the best material for sidewalks? It's a variable. Yeah, I personally like concrete because it resists root uh, roots better. Grass won't grow up into it. There's a lot of asphalt uh, and a lot of different grasses. They're just compatible. And it'll infest and all your roots will infest in it. Your asphalt uh, uh, doesn't last near as many years. It will dry and crack. And it's extremely susceptible to root damage. And is concrete more or less expensive than asphalt? Concrete is more expensive. Concrete's running, I believe, right now about forty-five dollars a lineal foot for installation. And I, I don't have a current price on what that would be in asphalt, but you can, you can, it's likely two or three times the price of asphalt. But a far, far superior, unless you're putting a nature trail or something like that, that you'd want the aesthetics of asphalt. Then it's a different product, or, or back where you're, you don't have a bunch of trees and all. So it, a lot of it depends on your application. But personally, I like well, personally I like concrete curb and gutter, and uh, concrete sidewalks. I wear a snowplow and ride ride right up against the curb and clean it off, and you know everything's fine. But I, we will never be there. Now it, it would take millions and millions and millions of dollars to do that in a community this size. I'm sorry, millions to do what? Uh, to put in curb and gutter, concrete curb and gutter pan okay. on all of our main roads. Now here is a sidewalk, and here is a tree, and you can see what happened. That is likely an eight or nine inch rise. This backside is asphalt, and this is the actual piece of concrete. So the trees will eventually even damage concrete. They will lift the entire slab up. Obviously, this tree shouldn't be there. It's, it's the, the island between there and the roadway is, is much too small. And you notice that over the years, they even built a little retaining wall out here to help keep the tree in there. This is the same tree looking up into where it's situated. It's situated right on the utility lines. Not a pretty sight. This is also the same tree. We lost half of it through an ice storm or some other storm, and it, and it still has been left there. So obviously, the tree must go. Either that or the sidewalk must go. They, it's impossible to have those two features occupy the same space. They are not compatible. Or to get a type of tree that does not have the root system, which can going to destroy a, uh, uh, a sidewalk. And there are a lot of trees that are used in landscape plans that will not hurt the, they will sit there and grow and the root systems are very shallow and they, they won't affect it. But they have other side effects too for winter storms and also. It's a complex problem. Lands <coughs> excuse me, landscape in open spaces 
This is everything you see as you go through our community. It's a lot of what we've all talked about. It could be potholes, it could be our signs. Um, I like the thing at the end of it, it's like our town manager stated in his employment interview, bad roads are like missing teeth. And it's true. They, <coughs> they are what you see when you go through our community. Now, I'll be the first to admit, we become immune to what we have around us. We see this stuff and we don't pay attention to it. I'm very sensitive to it because I, I think I've told other people I, I've spent most of my life dealing with this. So I'm very sensitive to the visual environment. To me, it, uh, I, I refer back, it's when you get on an airplane, you pull down your, your uh, plate in front of you and there's a coffee stain on there. And it, if, if there's coffee stain there, it questions what, what kind of maintenance they're doing on their engines. Because if they can't keep the plane clean, <coughs> I, I just don't know what they're doing on the engine. So I worry about visual things because I figure if the very obvious is going untouched, what's happening behind the scenes? And that may be just my jaded way of looking at it. But <coughs> Open spaces. Here's, a, here's an interesting sign. I don't know where these fines come from. But this is the heaviest lit, uh, littering fine I've ever seen. It's $5,500 for the first offense and 15000 for subsequent. So I think we've, we've found a budget cure. <laughs> we just start looking for litterers. Now this is, uh, this is going to be a little, it, this comes across a little bit sarcastic, but I want to, it falls in line with this visual quality. Only a, uh, only a little. Falls in line with this visual quality thing. That sign is located right there. Okay, and we know where this is at. We don't even have to tell you where it's at. And this is still like this. This is the present condition. This is visual quality. Where is it? Richard, could you tell us? Cause I don't oh, this is, this is down near Bark Hall Road, where that little pull-off area is. Oh, okay. And this is also down. Now, these, these have now been removed. Mm -hmm. This was a, a very ancient uh, guardrail assembly that has literally taken years. And this is what I'm saying. We get used to this stuff and we, it no longer strikes us as being important because we've, we're around it every day. <coughs> and when I, I would go by this every day and, and it, I could just feel my blood pressure go up because it was so obvious, but yet it's there and it's been there for many years. But it now, thank the Lord, has been removed. Uh, Paul recognizes this. This, these timbers have also been replaced now, but this was a visual quality thing. These were pressure treated timbers and you can imagine how many years it took them to decompose and to rot away. And this has now been replaced and the replacement in there looks fantastic. This is visual quality. This is what I see, unfortunately, when I, when I drive around any town. You see the signs? Look at them, they're all skewed and bent you got a crack, cur uh, crack curb section there, grass along the median. If you drive through our community or, or any community and you start looking at the visual quality things, look at your traffic signs and see how many are still legible. How many signs are moldy, just molded over with green mold or whatever. Uh, how many signs are bent, crooked, twisted, rusted, uh, all visual quality. And I, and I understand, I, I agree with you totally, this, this is the kind of uh, the end result of what you get these things done, but it's the, uh, the sensitizing of, of everybody of this being wrong can start to help us. And when we get people, because we have a lot of people that float around and do go by these signs and all on a daily basis, and they could get out. They have the equipment to get out and possibly straighten it up. I'm not saying they're going to, I'm just saying these are the things I'm looking at. Resource needs. We had a road study back in uh, 2009, and they stated by the year 2000, uh, or 2014, we would have $27 million backlog in our road program. Since 2009, our roads, based on their study, have been deteriorating $8,109 daily. That's our daily uh, drag down on a road system. Annual requirements right now, we could be spending three to $4 million on our road systems yearly right now. That includes uh, the drainage and all along there too, some drainage repairs. Water system, the reports indicate we're about $55 million in the hole. Sidewalks, $5 million. Structures, $123 million. And remember, this is not all of the structures in town. There's a lot of resources that are not included in these studies. Sewage system, uh, DPW estimated $75 million currently, and it's being currently evaluated. Drainage, 
currently being evaluated, the top 10 projects are 2.5 million. And I will note that this year we, we actually, or last year and this year, we got rid of two of the top projects on the drainage. So they have been finished. <clears throat> the money, I put this in only, only just for a reference on what money is, not to imply anything. Average home in, in Long Meadow is $342,000. A $1 million override has a tax burden of $168 per year. Current, currently, we're at least $300 million of noted deficiencies. Nothing more than just a reference point. So obviously, you can't tax your way out. Obviously, it can't be done that way. The realities. We need to increase our capital improvement program from one million to, to four to five million, to just to identify the asphalt and some of the other slight concerns which we've shown you. We need a balanced approach between revenue and spending. We need proactive approach to infrastructure maintenance and repair. And we must meet the needs of our community and not the wants. This is a pretty important thing because we all get caught up with people wanting things and squeaky wheels do get taken care of and we know that but we need to look at our policies and concentrate back on the total needs of our community right now our expenditures are outpacing our revenues our two and a half percent is just barely keeping up with our labor agreements as we brought out this year so it's not providing enough room to expand and put money towards the resources and towards these large purchases that are that are hidden down the pipe we currently have over 300 million identified deficiencies, and that's from the studies that are current. Our current five-year capital plan is requesting a little over $14 million. That's for our current capital five-year plan. By the way, there was, there was two sheets in there, but this is, I grabbed this one. This one's 14, the other was 34. I haven't figured out why they were different. The, the odd thing you have to understand, at least 22% of these funds shown here are not included in the studies. The 14,000 includes a, a tremendous amount of money that we put into our fleet and could be some of our ball fields, et cetera, which were not included in that $300 million worth of uh, deficiencies. At our current rate of expenditure, it'll take us approximately 134 years to correct our known deficiencies right now that we have under our present funding and the way we're going. And I, and I think obviously everybody understands it. That can't happen. I mean. All these things, what I've showed you, the timelines on, they can't be allowed to go that far or they will, they will fail. They will, we will be 100% reactive. We will basically do whatever failed over the weekend Monday morning. That will be our work routine. The realities, this is, this is a good one. It's applicable because we're sitting at the school. Ponder the thought that we have a brand new multi-million dollar high school and the street out front is in disrepair and you've driven it tonight, it's cracked, there's potholes, it's falling apart, and yet we're sitting in a multi-million dollar brand new high school. And, and I asked, how could it happen? Improvement strategies, implementation of asset management system townwide. Broadly, broadly, this is, uh, broadly defined, uh, an asset management system is a systematic fashion of, of managing assets based on predetermined standards and desired outcomes. That's a lot of funny words, but basically it says we're going to develop a program that, that identifies all of our needs and we're going to start to systematically work on it. Program development should be driven by experience in order to achieve desired results. This is likely a fairly important part here. We may very well have to go outside of our town and get some professional expertise in here to help us develop a, an asset management program. It, it's a large undertaking. And if it's not done properly, uh, it, it will not help you. Because we have to identify it. If we can't plan until we've identified everything that needs to be done. And folks, we got a ton of stuff that tells us what needs to be done. But there's still more. So it's still not full picture. And do not allow a system to define your needs. For instance, if we got a, a Ajax company computer system in here, maintenance management system, and we attempt to make that thing do all of our needs, it may not be what we need. So if you're doing asset management, you have to develop your needs first and what you want a system to perform, and then you find a system that does all those needs. 
Improvement strategies, operations evaluations on all departments. These are just some highlights. Uh, operations evaluation on departments is good. We check all departments against best, best practices. Uh, it's amazing sometimes what you can find. Greatly expanded outreach activities for funding assistance from Beacon Hill. We really need to start doing dog and pony shows. This is extremely important because we're not getting the attention that we deserve in this community. I'm concerned for the traffic flow that comes through this community that does not originate in this community and that the current formula for Chapter 90 dollars does not take into consideration average daily traffic. And we have an abundance of average daily traffic that does not originate here and we need to really be pounding on some doors with this data. Review and amend appropriate, appropriate uh, debt management policies. I think finances committee talked about that. Review land management and brainstorm improvements. You know, I, I've heard since I've been on the board and before I got on the board, we talk about the water tower property. And it would be nice if we could just figure out what we want to do with that. Is that a revenue source? Is that something we need to do up there? Let's, let's get it outlined on, on an annual strategic planning document. Let's get it out in the open. We, let's get a lot of people together can can add input and tell us what the best direction of our community is and start to lay the foundation down. We have a lot of land in our community that's used for recreation. Do we need it all? Is it appropriate where it's at? I mean, where are we going? <clears throat> I look at the capital program and every time I look at the capital program, I question some of the jobs that are in there because I know there's decisions that may need to be made in three years from now that affect that job that's in there right now. And I'm very concerned that we can possibly be spending money on something that's going to be a mistake three years from now. Closing, we have a significant challenge ahead of us that must be, must be managed through. Status quo is not an acceptable path for us to follow in the future. We can't do it any longer. Changes must be institutionalized if we are to succeed. That is very important right there because whatever we do has to transcend <coughs> different boards, different division chiefs, different town managers. It is a document and a system that must be in place that stays here. And it's implemented and it, it, it's, it's a living document that keeps going year after year after year. Regardless of who's here, it keeps going. Nothing off limits for the review and modification. Sacred cow is not allowed. End presentation. Thank you. Okay. Could you go back to that one slide where you had the... Uh, asphalt? The asphalt, exactly. There you go. Yeah, that's great. Let me get the lights, too, so we can not talk in the dark. Richard, will you be emailing that presentation to all each of us? I will. Thank you. <clears throat> and then um, I want to make sure it's posted on the website, This because I know you had one before, but we want this current updated one. Yeah. And I think uh, it's a great presentation. It shows us where we are right now. And the question is, how are we going to get where we need to be? Because there's no way we're going to come up with the type of money that's required. But how do we start, as I like saying, turning the <coughs> ship to get us right. there? Now, one of the things you talked about is we have to advocate with Boston. Right. And um, I think the water sewer bill that I sent, I think everyone got. Did everyone get the... Um, the mm -hmm. bill that's coming up, and I'm hoping they'll vote on it in January, and it's coming from the Senate. And uh, we need to write a letter on what our water and sewer projects are. And I think we got some information from um, the water sewer department and the town manager. And <coughs> I apologize. I was hoping that letter would be done for us here so we could start reviewing it. But I will get that in a day or two. But some of our major projects, we have to turn to Boston. But I think Boston is not going to come through for us when it comes to the roads and our chapter 90 if I'm correct was supposed to be doubled and instead it was cut this year when we the battle between the house and the uh, governor and I if if the road tax I mean the gas tax fails we should could even see more cuts so my question is and I think I've talked to you about this how do we start as a town making sure that we do the mills rather than wait till it's now more expensive. How do we now start to commit funds in our budget 
to, so it doesn't cost us more down the road? Well, our, our efforts today are going to be many, many years before you see benefits from it because we are already so far behind the curve. Yeah. But right now we're <coughs> only getting about 450000 from our uh, Chapter 90. Did we get that last year? Did we get the 450 or did we get less? No, we get less than that. Yeah, a little bit yeah. less. I, I thought I used 450 because that's yeah. what I saw in the budget figure. And we've and from capital, I believe we've been putting in about 500,000 more towards the roads. Mm -hmm. So that's got you at 950. Now keep in mind, Mike, on this size road system, Mike needs to be spending somewhere in the vicinity of four to five hundred thousand dollars a year on routine maintenance, mm -hmm. just preventative type maintenance on the road system. That's the crack ceiling and all that. So you see we're down to five hundred thousand dollars so we're dealing right now with maybe a mile and a half maybe two miles of a mill and overlay well, uh, i believe converse street wasn't two hundred thousand dollars for that quick mill on converse mm -hmm. so you're right now uh we we <coughs> somehow have to shift money into our recurring uh, program to have more money available to do the hardcore maintenance because you know like mr santanello had mentioned that we spend a lot of money, but it's not all resource determined. Yeah. Uh, this year, I forget how much Mike's got in for equipment, but that's going to every year that's going to be three to four hundred thousand dollars, and that's only going to inch up because vehicles are becoming more expensive. And, and there's, there's a lot of you, you said something about resource. I didn't understand what you meant by that. You said it was only, but only a certain amount was resource driven. Oh yeah. In other words, in the in the capital program. <coughs> we have pieces of it that go towards roads and sewage systems, but there's a large chunk of money that goes towards equipment purchasing. Now, it's still capital, but it's not what we're thinking of capital. We were thinking capital going out and redoing our roads, but it's not. There's, there's money that's going in for, say, doing, uh, could be an athletic field. It could be uh, the field to track up there this year. About $90,000 are coming in on that. Uh, there's a lot of other things, uh, maintenance that's occurring in some of the structures. So there's things that are happening that aren't really going back to those core resources. The core resources is what's hurting us because uh, they're so expensive <coughs> to repair to start with. Now, you, but we talked about, you, you're saying that we need to at some point sort of jump ahead of it so we can start the mill and maintenance so it doesn't cost us in the future. I mean, should we be bonding? and do a large push forward on the roads and that part of the infrastructure or how do we get ahead of the curve or are we always going to be doing get ahead of the curve with money there's mm -hmm. no other way to get ahead of the curve clear and simple you it's impossible any other way uh i don't think you're going to make a quantum leap to get ahead of that curve i think you're going to have to set a slower approach and, and accept the fact that we've got into this hole and it's going to take a little while to dig ourselves out and, and it is going to take time. I think we can do. I think we can do some politicking on our Chapter 90 funds. I think it's well worth taking a real run at trying to get the formulation changed, because there's more communities like Longmeadow. We're not the only one that's suffering because of the criteria the way it's set up. Mm -hmm. So there, there is that avenue to go at. But but right now, Marie, we could spend three to four million dollars <coughs> a year just on our asphalt roads for doing mill and overlays right now. And once we got the system up, once it's totally repaired, then that would keep our system functional. Because we, the chart was showed, I think we said eight miles, we need to do eight miles a year. A simple mill, let's say of 300,000, that's 2.4 million just for the mill and overlay with no sidewalks repair, no drainage repair, no deep repair. That's just mill and overlay. And we, we saw with the one slide mm -hmm. that there were some deep, deep repairs were going to have to be made. So that starts to add money to the puzzle. So actually bonding three or four million dollars for road repairs isn't going to get us there because you're talking about such a huge hill. Not really. It's, it's not. Okay. You're, we're going to have to find large infrastructure money. We're going to have to start searching for massive stimulus money if it's ever coming down again. We need to increase the amount of money that's available in our program to allow DPW to at least extend their planning phase a little bit because we're we're underfunding them to the point where it's hard to get a, a, a good repair program going because a lot of times they need money they need to know money's coming two years in advance to get the specs and the clearances all ready to do the project <coughs> it's almost impossible to give them 
$500,000 this spring for a project you want done this year unless it's something they can just go out and throw a contract as an asphalt contractor on. Mm -hmm. All that other stuff needs in the planning process, it needs to be identified construction plus two years for planning or whatever for all the clearances. Uh, I think we've seen increased <coughs> emphasis in the last three or four years on the TIP program. We need to increase our efforts on the TIP. We need to, and that's a conscious decision that we have to make in advance to do the advanced engineering to be able to be eligible for TIP. So that's going to take money. And we can only do that with the guidance of uh, the Director of Public Works and the Engineering Department on saying, okay, what's, what's your projects? What's it looking like? What can we start to do advanced planning? Now that basically, it's not totally free money, but boy, you bunch will call it free money. When we get the TIP money approved, that's, that's great dollars. And we have several of our roads that are eligible for TIP. But that's something we can do, is increase the emphasis on that, and like Cooley. Mm -hmm. Cooley was put in in 2012, 2010, 11? Nine, I think. Okay, sure very nine. recent, and, and it's being mm -hmm. funded now. That's a $500,000 project. Mm -hmm. I know they're working on Converse. I know that project's out mm -hmm. there. I think, Mark, you, that Seven. started when you were in the chair. Is that 17. correct? 2017. Yeah. 2017. Yeah, but they, they're going to have to have the design money because in order to get into the TIP, you've got to get the design work done to get the state approved. it. So are you saying for the budget this year, your main recommendation would just be to start putting more money in advance engineering for the TIP? Well, no. They, I'm just I'm laying all the things on the table that you can consider. I don't think we should make a snap decision. I think we sit as a board and talk. There's so many variables on there. And, and maybe even an off not even off camera, but maybe even a meeting where we talk with Mike and here and Yum and say, okay, what are we going to do, guys? How big's your TIP program? Mm -hmm. What is your five-year window? What are you really looking at? And then you, you start taking each duck and tipping them over as we, we get past them. But we may need to give uh, engineering, say, theoretically, we may need to give them $300,000 for the next four years just for TIP development projects. Mm -hmm. But once it's done, it's done. Then the TIP program is out there. And now all we have to do is push for funding. But you can't get it into the program unless we get the requirements up to the state mandate. And that's the hard part. Any other questions for Paul? Yeah, I, you know, you made a comment, and Richard, I think you, you gave my answer about what to put in the budget. And <clears throat> first of all, I think Richard had a, a pretty good point on the last slide is that we're sitting in a multi million dollar building with a road in disrepair out in front mm -hmm. of it. <coughs> I think it, this goes beyond budget. Um, this goes be, this goes in terms of um, leadership of the board is to address what really the issues are in town, not just what's politically expedient. The other thing I'd like to do is find out from, you know, we're talking about uh, the TIP programs in, in Congress Street, I think, has been in the hopper for a really long time. Not, I don't even think it's been two years. It's been at least three or four that I know of because the original design was to change right where that crosswalk area is to make a big lane to go for the trucks to take the right-hand turn to go into Springfield. That was part of the oh, initial, nice. that was a, a design from mm -hmm. Longmeadow people, not even TIP, <coughs> yeah. and it was held off for, I think, the TIP uh, study. But I think we need to prioritize what we need. I also think we need to hear from our DPW director about what our pavement, pavement management system is. And so, because I know that, that DPW has a listing of one through four, or A through E, whatever, the condition of the roads. And I think that drives the budget is what is needed to bring the roads back into repair that are either in disrepair and then take a look at the preventative maintenance. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can look at this and say, just do preventative maintenance because you have roads in total disrepair yeah. out there. So I think it goes into a much bigger discussion of what, what does DPW see as the need dollar wise for those roads? And what's the program that we have for it? I, I think all those things need to be taken <coughs> into consideration, not just, and not just roads, but facilities and water and sewer piping, because right. some of those projects you might be, one of the reasons why we didn't expend the big money on Converse was because of the water and sewer project that, in drainage that could potentially go with it. Right. And we didn't want to do a massive uh, pay, repavement of Converse Street and then have to go in and dig it up again to do the water and sewer. So we did the quick fix, which, Fortunate, I think, so far has bought us about three years, but because it all goes into that bigger discussion of the tip funding for that project and so forth. So, I think we need to look at all of that, and <coughs> and you're not going to do it like you said, Richard. You can't tax your way to it because it's no. You know, we're getting close to our, our maximum mill rate. We're yeah, not yeah. deadly close, but we're pretty close. Um, and I think we have to be cognizant of of what we're actually asking people to pay for. Um, 
you know, there was one board member I remember said that we're going to put this off on future generations. And my argument is, so who gets to pick the generation you're putting it on? Is it the current people that are here paying their taxes or it's future people? Or is there some sort of common sense in the middle that says you have to do this over time? But I think we have to have a plan of attack, and it's not just what's going to be in the budget this year. I think we have to look a little bit more longer term for some of this stuff. Um, and actually develop a plan that says how do you attack the the elephant in the room and, and um, um, I think that would be a more a, a, a more prudent approach but I, I still like to I think Mike can tell you off the top of his head how much money he needs to fix the roads in disrepair I, I think it's already it, we know it um, so you know, if we want to raise five million bucks this year I think that'll be a, I don't think anything else gets done but um, anyway, I, I just think that we need to put it all into perspective and and look at that big picture and say how do how do we come up with a plan to attack it and what are, what are we going to burden people with at any point in time with this because tax wise, <coughs> you know, you put three million bucks in the budget this year, uh, you know, as a, even if it's a debt exclusion, it's still going to have to be paid for through your property, you know, through your uh, through your taxes and so forth. So it does, just because it's not it, it's it's fallen outside of two and a half doesn't mean that it's the it's a good thing to do if, if you're going to really overburden people. Mark? Yeah, Richard, I, I think <coughs> thank you for putting this pr presentation together. But I, if I could, I, I'd like to kind of take another approach, and that is I don't think we have an infrastructure problem. I think mm -hmm. we have a financial problem. And, and that is that there's not a problem you didn't that you presented that can't be solved if we had a ton of money. True. Uh, and, and, in fact, I think the number is like 300 million tons of money kind of yeah. kind of thing. And, and, and we can talk around solving this, but what we really need to talk about is a different way of coming up with funds. And, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but that includes additional sources of income. We're significantly changing the way we're doing some things that we're doing to free up money to do the things we need to <coughs> do. And, and the examples are, you know, new sources of income. We've talked on and on about the things that have come up. How do you do things differently? Stop paying when we go Six hundred thousand or seven hundred thousand dollars for street lights, and cut that in a third, and be able to, without a change in tax rate, divert two thirds of that money to infrastructure. You know, if we had a four or five hundred thousand dollars a year extra for for infrastructure, you know, you could put together a scenario, and I proposed this at one point. You should take a part of it, and and you you put it into into different bonds of different lengths of time. So if you take five or six hundred thousand dollars, maybe you take Two hundred thousand dollars a year, and you could put together some significant capital <coughs> expenditures for the next four or five or six years that you would pay off over time by using that money to pay off a bond. So I, I think that that the problems need to be addressed, but for us to argue over what comes first, the water or the sewer, or the streets or the you know or, or the drainage or the roofs, because we didn't even talk about building roofs. Mm -hmm. You had a whole list there about building <coughs> roofs or right. or the furnaces and the buildings that the town buildings and all that other stuff, we need to focus on how to come up with the money. And it's not, in my opinion, by taxing because it's, you know, we just increased our tax rate 6 or 7% to, to pay for the school. And I don't think the people in town are too, uh, too amenable to, to doing that again for something uh, uh, as important as it is of, of the infrastructure. So I'd like to see if we couldn't spend some time over the next couple of weeks or months as we go to the next budget and seriously talk about doing some things differently to free up money. I can't, I can't disagree, Mark. It is a matter of money. It's yeah. how do you get the money. And, <coughs> well, and I, was, I was just throwing some suggestions mm -hmm. out that we, we've got to think outside the box. Oh, yeah, we can go to the state and ask yeah. for money. Yeah. But you know what? There's 350 other cities and towns in Massachusetts who are in <coughs> equal or probably worse condition than us who will we'll get in line and perhaps they'll end up getting ahead of us even if we start the line. But maybe, and, as I say, we have to be first. Well, we yeah. have to start the line. But, but, right. Mike, but, but if we do things by changing the way we, we spend money in this town, mm -hmm. you know, and things that we have already identified that are achievable, you know, three or four or five hundred thousand dollars a year can do a lot more for us if we spend it correctly. Mm -hmm. so. Go ahead, Richard. Now, the town manager wants to speak? You can go ahead and follow mm -hmm. Mark's point. Okay. The, uh, I wasn't going to rebuttal anything. Mark yeah. and I have talked. I had this yeah, discussion yeah. before. Mm -hmm. We have different theories on it. We, we both agree with what has to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just touching bases on some of the things we can do. In, in this discussion, it, it must continue. We mm -hmm. have to. I mean, we've got, if nothing else, experiment with stuff. Uh, the asset management is 
likely the one of the most important things we'll do in this community in the next couple of years to get this in and get a <coughs> grasp on what we're doing on a daily basis and how we're doing it and is it profitable and, and do we need to continue doing it there's so many questions to be answered to an asset management program if it's properly put in mm -hmm. there was another thing too to keep in mind you're talking strategies uh, in this day and age we should be able to bring up on the whiteboard a, a a G GPA or GIS of the entire town and start to have all the water lines put in and show the ages and where the critical ones that need to be replaced and then you overlay it with drainage and you overlay it with roads and you overlay it with gas lines and then you can drill down almost through that process on the most critical piece of real estate that you have out there for maximizing dollars. You know we did talk to one community that did, did along that line and they were able to use a lot of their enterprise funds for asphalt repairs because they were replacing water lines and sewer lines at the same time. So they identified the cherries, the, the quick cherries first and, and it, it really started to work to their benefit. But that's a that's an internal process mm -hmm. and I, I think we're going in that way, Steve, and I think there's layers, more layers being made up on our uh, GIS. Yeah, yes, and I, I would say um, there's more layers being made up, I think, as you noted, um, and as our report, as I submitted to the, in the packet of my report, we are about to go live sometime in January with uh, a work management software program. Um, our vendor for that is Cartograph, and it'll, it's web-based, and it basically is a, a version of an asset management or work management mm -hmm. system like Richard described, and he's absolutely right. It's, it's critical <coughs> um, to have one to really not only properly assess and prioritize what the work is but then measure how the work is go how the work was done how many resources it used and find ways to do efficiencies when I saw the demonstration of it I I, I wonder how how do communities live without it quite honestly mm -hmm. it's it's that important uh, and, and I think Richard has highlighted it, uh, on many occasions the um, the, the lack of uh, inspections and it always feels a little bit like being caught with your pants down when you see something like that 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 our public works personnel just didn't catch and it, to some extent it's driving by it every day you don't notice but that's not an excuse for not noticing something like the uh, the, the timbers or rotted railroad ties down by the high school and um, <coughs> with this new system we'll have a web based and uh, I believe Apple you know uh, smartphone and mm -hmm. uh, iPad based um, complaint system mm -hmm. so now we can have you know anyone in the town that has an iPhone or an, or an iPad can be part of the inspectional staff, mm -hmm. and if they see something, they can report it, and it gets it gets logged. And so, we'll, that'll make that'll, I think clarify where the needs are. And the other thing is, we're in the process of, of developing a capital improvement plan. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I'm starting it now a, a, a more <coughs> in depth look than I've had since I've been here in terms of the the projects and needs and. You know, the capital plan. I mean, if you could fully fund every single need every year. You know, you you could you could attack this, but it's just it's not there. The pie is by and large fixed uh, in terms of the resources we have to deal with, and um, notwithstanding new revenue opportunities and things like that, I mean, it's by and large we are reliant on property taxes, and it's trying to slice it different ways to accommodate shifting priorities in a given year. And you know, there's no end to the work we could do. <coughs> so I think it's. Seeing the planning that goes into that, I think, is, is good because they plan five years out. I mean, they could tell you the things they want to do now and in in five years from now. It's just each year you go through it, and you, you know this. Mm -hmm. You go through it, and you basically pick what can we afford this year. And uh, and I think it, and this makes us like a lot of communities, but that's where you defer a project. The costs and the needs go like this the further mm -hmm. out you get. And uh, the final thing I'll say is, I don't know if you said this, I don't know if I heard it, but the TIP is the Transportation Improvement mm -hmm. Program, and that is a it's funded by a, a, a pool of state funds mm -hmm. that are managed by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Like right. all RPC, all regional planning commissions in the Commonwealth manage these TIP funds, and so each town that is in the region um, basically competes mm -hmm. on an annual basis for these funds. That real, you know, and I think whether it's it's funding for the STIP, the State Transportation Improvement Plan, mm -hmm. or Chapter 90 or the gas tax, the thing I have I am encouraged by is um, both the legislature and the current governor have all said we need we need to spend a lot more money on roadways and infrastructure, and they've made 
some decisions to do that. Um, in fact, I think the, the chapter 90 issue broke down because it wasn't spending enough, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know how. Which left us with less. Yeah, was, yeah I mean, I, I'll, I'll reserve comment on that. But Massachusetts, uh, in a way that I have not heard in other states, um, because they know that most towns are suffering from this, really are making a renewed approach or a renewed commitment to doing it. It just hasn't materialized in the annual um, formula funds. Mm -hmm. So I, I thank you for, for pointing all this stuff out to me. I think I, I have agreed with you on this, um, that this is an issue we need to address. <coughs> Richard. Oh, Alex. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Richard. I, and I, for me, you know, as some of my questions probably betrayed, this was uh, probably more educational for me, being uh, new to the board than probably other people. But I think it would also be very educational to members of the public. Mm -hmm. um, I, and to follow up on Mark's point about this being a financial issue, I, I would agree with that. And to me, fundamentally, it's also a political issue because you need engagement with the community. Um, you know, we've made reference to this high school. You think about the level of community engagement, the grassroots organizing that took place whether you agree with the, this new high school or don't agree, that is what was necessary to put up one building. Mm -hmm. You know, the type of the $300 million that you're talking about, I think we're going to need a similar level of engagement. Um, it's not something the select board can do on its own and can't do it town. Um, you know, and if we exclude the possibility of tax increases, um, then you have to get people on board for massive cuts. You've got to be able to sell those cuts and to say that what we're doing with infrastructure is more important. And uh, I, I think that's the sort of conversation that we need to be having. And I think to have that conversation, we really need to be talking not about a five-year plan or what's on the plate for this year, but the whole $300 million that we're looking at so that people really understand the enormity of it and the need for action. It, I agree. And it, keep in mind, as I said three or four times, this is not all of it. This is just certain resource groups. It's bigger than that. Right. I mean, we, when we review the capital <coughs> program this year, I think you'll clearly see because there's some big ticket items in there being requested for items that aren't even displayed in this. It's new improvements, it's new things we need now, irrigation systems, et cetera, gen generators and all this type of stuff, all very valid projects. But it's rolling up against what we've just presented tonight also. And this, you know, Marie, this is going to go on for years. It's going to take years to get through this. But I think, I think what I said before, if, if we could set down somehow an institutionalized processes and, and start to set policy documents on, on where we're going and where we're at on this, it would be to our benefit. And just to talk here 10 minutes and walk away is not going to solve it. I mean, you talk about blue ribbon panels. So this is the type of thing where you set up a working group and they work on this and they, they mull over ideas and they talk with the town manager division chief and they try to get a strategy that works and that we can come before the board and we say, yeah, we're going to try this, we're going to implement it. And we take it, take it to town meeting and talk about it. This presentation, or something like this, take it to town meeting and talk to the people. I mean, Alex said with the schools, he's absolutely right. Uh, most people in our community are not aware of how many resources we need to work on because they, they've never been exposed to that, that crucial factor. They've heard tidbits here and there, and they know a pothole gets fixed, but they don't understand that the reason that pothole <coughs> is there to start with is that the road is way past the point of repair, and that that's what it's going to be now is potholes. Now, you mentioned policies. Mm -hmm. What type of policies are you talking about that we should be bringing back to this board? Is it this board that has to be making those decisions on policies? Are you saying it's DPW and the way they approach projects? What is the next step that we can do as a board? It, it's yes on everything that you said. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and Stephen knows that too. He's talking about the asset management system. You, we talked about the inspections, and I, and I think clearly, and, and I, I know it's unfair sometimes to throw some of this stuff up when the town manager's here, and it, it can be like a form of embarrassment. It's not intended to be that mm -hmm. way. It's just saying, look, we got a problem, and we see the problem, we need to fix it. Obviously, our present system does not incorporate a lot of inspections. Mm 
-hmm. And if it does, then we don't have standards. And if we have standards and we have inspections, then it means the work's not being scheduled. And if all those are positive, then it means our people are not doing the work. And I refuse to believe that because mm -hmm. when we bring this to the attention of the town manager and Mike Rabel, and they go out and they fix it, the repair work is great. They do a quality job. But it's just, it shouldn't ever have to be reported by a select board member. Occasionally, if something will happen, but it should never be that. And I think what we've done a lot of times, I know in my energies, is to, to keep bringing this to the format and saying, mm -hmm. look, we need to change what we're doing. We're not going down the right path. I shouldn't have to be inspecting facilities. There should be a, a maintenance person inspecting facilities. You know, we talked about <coughs> the, the pools and everything else. This should be done on a routine basis. And if he gets into the asset management system, the system he's talking about, it should set this up to where inspections are done on all the resource groups in our town every year, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. once every five years, every year. Like right now, I mentioned in the slide, right now DPW should be out inspecting drainage because all the foliage is gone and they can see all these tailpipes and these inlets and everything is visible to see because when in the, in the summer it gets all vined over and you can't see it. And there's certain, this is what you do on a systematic program. There's certain resources that you inspect at certain times of the year at the opportune time. And also to facilitate the proper scheduling of repairs. Mm -hmm. Like you inspect now, you repair three months from now when you get the supplies and materials in, get the work scheduled, and you get the job done or get the contractors lined up. Asset management will bring all of that hopefully to the fore. It should if it's implemented properly. Mm -hmm. We will see a radical change in how our community is being maintained within a two-year period if this is successful. Well, actually, what we should probably have in the way of a perfect system is the new high school. There should probably be inspection standards, maintenance, all rolled out with the opening of the building. Is yes, there should have been a large turnover manual that came in it, it mm -hmm. specified it all systems mm -hmm. yeah, and everything mm -hmm. even to the point of mentioning which <coughs> vendors are qualified to do it because or certainly our staff and I mean this with total respect our staff can't be up to speed on some of the sophisticated systems that are in this building these are highly specialized systems so that would be like a model system we would look at mm -hmm. to try to start implementing that's in an other areas that's an in asset town. management mm -hmm. within its own right mm -hmm. and it's a big challenge it's going to take a lot of work but it's doable. Every bit is doable, and most of it's doable in-house. The, the guidance on how to set up may be a, a little bit. That's where we may need to talk to asset management people, even some of Collins Center or whoever, that, that does this type of stuff and come in and say, okay, here's what you need to do. Here's how you set it up, and here's the blueprint. Mm -hmm. Well, like, so we're, it's still pending, but we have that initiative with Collins Center that we're going to be working on mm -hmm. that I think hopefully – have some synergy with the uh, <coughs> excuse me with the asset management program right, and, and I tell you what Stephen likely what we should do this year is we got a conference coming up what January yeah and and while we're up in Boston we ought to go ahead and talk to some of the asset people up there mm -hmm. there will be people up there that do this and it, we may be able to get an even a slide presentation of some info. it's not it's not excruciatingly difficult to implement it but it is time-consuming and you really need to know what you're doing to set it up properly mm -hmm. And it is going to require a lot of accountability. I mean, inspections and timetables and all that. There's a lot of accountability that comes in, but it, it does professionalize our operation. Now, as a board, the, one of the things you're recommending is that we take a look at what our TIP projects are in the pipeline and seeing how we are inadequately engineering in the future. So that should be a presentation we should be looking at for it's this just, board. That's just one little piece, yeah. yeah. Mark talked about the street lights get it up flush the document out either yay or nay mm -hmm. and well if, that's if, if that the tip projects different this is revenue right. enhancements but I mean, which so, i think we like should have a meeting that's on. the type of things that we should <coughs> mm -hmm. be bringing forth and looking at asset mm -hmm. management is starting he's, he's getting ready to unfold a maintenance management system a new one and we need to be looking at, at that. We need to be talking about the criteria for going to Boston on yeah. the water sewers and mm -hmm. working on it hard right now. I know. But the TIPS money, just to be clear, is very limited in terms of the roads that qualify for it. Correct, Paul. Right. So we got five or six of the main roads in town that qualify. Mm -hmm. Converse, Williams, uh, Longmeadow, mm -hmm. uh, Frank Smith. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and which? somewhat ironic, not ironically, but somewhat um, Frustratingly, they qualify by virtue of the fact that they carry truck traffic. Mm 
<laughs> right. <laughs> so it's you get you get the money because you get the trucks, but you need the money more frequently because you have the trucks. Right. And, and and I think that's the one point I got back is we need to tell them how many trucks we're getting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that formula is skewed for mm -hmm. regular communities that have have actual uh, factories and all in them, and we don't have them. And so um, I think we have some steps going forward and advocating for our TIP program as well as I think the water sewer bill that's right in front of us. Uh, I will put that together and get that in front of the board so we can start um, yeah, brushing said, it up and getting that out to our state senator. Let me say we're hoping no more than just to open the dialogue again for the board mm -hmm. to talk. And, and there's a lot of great ideas that need to be fleshed mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Then we have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, okay. Richard. This I was very, it was valuable. Okay, so the next is uh, casino update. We are uh, moving along. Do you want to give us a little update on where we are? I Right now we have meetings scheduled every night this week and Friday afternoon, and I'm hoping we won't need all of those. But for open meeting law, we need to have them in line so if we're ready to go with the information, uh, the meeting times are available. Mm -hmm. I will try to be very cognizant of everyone's schedule so that it's not a last-minute change. For a minute? Mm -hmm. Because you have, we have a meeting every night this week that's posted. Yes. Why? Because just like what we did with the town manager contracts, if that we come up with some information and we need to uh, deliberate on it, um, I want us to be able okay, to so, pull together. Okay, so my question, that, mm -hmm. that good, because that was yeah. what I was hoping for. So why, are, why do we want to meet, first of all, we're doing this under the pretense that MGM is going to come in and say, here's an offer and we want to talk about it, correct? No, or is the, it the information we're waiting for. We our are we're waiting for the information from our experts. I believe we have set up uh, Tuesday afternoon that the each individual select board member is a bit, uh, will be able to speak to our experts, and then we need to sit as a board and decide what our counter offer is. Because right now the next step is for us to provide a counter offer. Okay, but we we don't have anything in hand from our experts yet to sit down with them. Correct. No. No, we, uh, the w one report I was waiting on, we thought we'd have this afternoon and it has not arrived yet. Okay, so, so my point is to sit down with the experts tomorrow and tell them, uh, we're there supposedly to tell them that what we want individually in terms of to put into the counter offer. It's no, it's for us to ask questions. Yes. I, I think mm -hmm. they will be but, able but, to. Okay, mm -hmm. then, can I just mm -hmm. ask questions about what? Okay, hopefully the report will be mm -hmm. in our hands tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow afternoon and Wednesday, you'll be able to um, speak to Parsons and MRI, MRI about any specifics or any questions you have in regards to the information. And then from that information, we will sit as a board and uh, deliberate on a counteroffer. Okay. On which day this week would we do that? So if we're going to meet with them tomorrow, mm -hmm. hopefully we have the report tomorrow. So mm -hmm. we're assuming we're going to get it from what time are they here? I, don't, I didn't see that in an no, email. No, you call. Mm -hmm. You can call that. I sent out that email, I think, Friday uh, with, their with their contact information where you can call them between the hours of 4 and 6 individually and ask mm -hmm. questions, get, get a verbal synopsis of what their analysis concludes. Um, and it, if I might add, mm -hmm. I think also the idea was to, since they were draft reports, to provide input about what the reports ought to Correct. contain. Correct. Now, I mean, frankly, it's a little tight even if we had gotten them tonight I mean but to get the report sometime tomorrow then I mean we don't really have much of a chance to digest it I mean is there any way that we could speak to the experts on Wednesday if we're getting the report tomorrow yeah if you there available, don't, sure. if you don't feel comfortable talking tomorrow I personally am going to be ready to speak to them tomorrow afternoon so I don't want to switch the times mm -hmm. out but anyone is asking for a later date on Wednesday because Tuesday does not work for them. Mm -hmm. well, it's I, just, I think we should I mean, accommodate. But it seems like mm -hmm. we have to read it first. Uh, you know, I mean. I think they'll be brief. Mm -hmm. The reports will be, I mean, relatively brief. Right. Our, our reports. Because mm -hmm. um, they're a synthesis of much larger information and really drills down into long middle impacts. And I, I can't say that for sure, but 
Uh, I, I, I know that in the case of MRI, it'll be a few pages. Um, and, and the uh, we're going to have to stagger these times, right? Because we can't all call at once. No, I, I encourage once. select board members to email and set up a specific time if they wanted. Okay. Um, but they are essentially having office hours, virtual office hours at their offices, so we didn't have to incur additional expense to have them here for phone conversations. Um, and considering the time, I probably think we should probably cancel Tuesday night's meeting because I think by the time mm -hmm. everyone gets everything together, so um, I will ask Debbie to cancel that, and uh, Wednesday will be our, our first meeting as a group. Okay, so my the only my question about the meetings are what do we what do we want to accomplish because I you know last the last meeting we had here which I think was Wednesday night, mm -hmm. you know Richard talked about we need a timeline but we talked about that three months ago so my my question is what do we so we get the report tomorrow hopefully we talk to the consultants at some point whether it's tomorrow Wednesday or whatever we meet on Wednesday to discuss the report that we have to deliberate that's what you said. Mm -hmm. And then what are we going to do Thursday and Friday? So I just I want us to have something that's that's going to hold this hold the meetings accountable, so that we're not just going to come in here and talk about MGM the offer we didn't get or what we want. And I, I just I want to make sure that we have a plan going into these meetings because right now the only agenda item is casino mitigation, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to kind of, because, I mean, are, are we going to try to come up with a counter offer between mm -hmm. now and Friday? That, that is hoping, the subject. Yes, so I'm how are we going to talk about that in open session? Well, the, what we had planned was that everyone ha would speak to the attorneys about their, uh, after the reports, you call and you speak to Brandon and you talk to him about what your opinion is on the counter offer should be. And they will take in ev each select board member's opinion and then they will make a recommendation for what the attorneys feel the counter offer should be. We deliberate and decide if we are going to make that counter offer. And I'm hoping we will have that decision on Wednesday. If we can't make it on Wednesday, then we meet on Thursday. If we can't make that on Thursday, we meet Friday. But from talking to the, we're going to get the report tomorrow, talk yes. to the experts tomorrow, yes. and then by Wednesday, we're going to have a formula for a counter offer. Yes. And if you don't feel it doesn't work it doesn't work but that is the the plan well I just don't want to come to a meeting every night in the week and talk about the same thing oh, so no. my, my my point is how, how do we formulate it first of all we have no information as mm -hmm. to what the reports are going to come to us in mm -hmm. but we're going to tell them what we want Absolutely. so we're going to have so our, our, our experts are going to get five different people telling them what they want individually and what money we should settle for or whatever our perceptions of that are and then they're going to go back to Brandon and say no. We just said the attorney. No, we speak, we get the information from our okay. experts, and then we talk to the attorney on what the offer should be. Parsons and MRI does not decide. That's a select board decision on what the counter offer okay. will be, and they discuss it with their attorney. The other option, because it, it does sound ham handed mm -hmm. to go about doing it that way, and um, the other option um, is to talk to the um, experts, get their view of the data, and then it, you know contact me or Marie individually with your views, and we can she and I can synthesize all of that and then prepare the counter um, with the assistance of the attorneys for select board review rather than trying to you know write it as a group in open session have us prepare it offline and then present it for a select board review and approval um, which is I think how most of these have, have gotten done um, the other thing I'll say is in terms of a format of a proposal I think our attorneys would advise that um, if they haven't already that the framework that MGM has initiated for the proposals will be what we'll be working off of, especially since that same framework has been accepted by several other communities around us, which I think will have some meaning to the commission. You think our attorneys are going to support the framework? You mean the structure of the deal that MGM has proposed? I think in terms recently? of, uh, when we discussed with the attorneys preparing a counter, we discussed in terms of responding to their framework redlined 
redlining their version of the uh, their their most recent proposal, which was of course Friday afternoon. Can I? Make mm -hmm. more? That uh, is something that I think is uh, a really bad idea. What I and what I had hoped to do and just didn't have the time to do because um, I have looked at the uh, draft agreement carefully was to prepare a memo to you all. I know that in the past we've had select board correspondence. Would it be proper for us to do that so that everybody could read it, read no. my memorandum beforehand? No, I think that we should go to the attorney. And that's why I'm, I feel the attorney should get your memorandum, should get all of our views on clauses and numbers that they're concerned about, and the attorneys will be uh, crafting a counter offer. It's it's not something that um, no. I'm just I'm asking. Us, okay. I'm asking. Is it yeah. possible? Well, I, I, don't, I think if you so. how would sending it to the attorney, the attorney distributing it from five to five select board members from one select board member, not be a violation of open meeting? Or I don't believe he's going <coughs> to take his memo and hand it to us. I think he will uh, t take the memorandum and take your mm -hmm. views and. Um, after hearing all of our views, we'll come up with what his, as our attorney's, recommendation is on the counter offer. If the five of us think we're going to create a counter offer, um, then I think we all should not be working and we should take the next three days in a room and, um, and come up with, we decided as a board we were going to have legal counsel well, and experts help us draft we, this. We did do that. Yeah. Back in the meeting at the at the at the senior center, mm -hmm. we actually came up with a list of things that we said were going to be an impact to Long Meadow. And I thought, I quite frankly, I thought that's what these experts were working off of the directive that we gave yes. that said. So how are we going to come up with anything different than what they came up with? Because I thought that's what their whole job was going to be doing with Brandon. And that was, and I think before we worry on whether they <coughs> did what we asked them to or not, we need to hear what their reports are. But that's two different issues. One is the reports coming from the expert. The second is how do we draft a counter offer, and and those are two different things. I would even separate to say financial terms mm -hmm. versus non-financial terms in ter uh, of the agreement. Mm -hmm. So l let me ask a. a different question the latest communication from MGM said that uh, it had been represented that we would present a counteroffer this week mm -hmm. and where is that coming from I don't think we've ever decided that I think we've been pushing towards preparing a counteroffer we but discussed who's the that we I mean the, the board I, I don't think we've ever decided to do that I, I mean to I'm all, sure there was I, consensus I think, I, I would we think our timeline <laughs> I mean, this is MGM's timeline. I mean, mm -hmm. and uh, to me, everything's been contingent. It's like, wait, wait, wait. We're waiting for information. And we're still in that point, which, well, you know, I understand Well, when it comes to why. Wednesday and Thursday, if a counter offer is put on the table and you don't want to vote for that, then you will vote uh, against it. Our attorneys made it very clear that it is time in the process for us to make a counter offer. This is our well, we attorney's but recommendation. This is, this is a client we don't decision. want to vote. No, I believe. Mayor, can I ask so you that? Because can I just ask the question? Can mm -hmm. you clarify why did the attorney? I don't see it in this documentation of why. You just said the attorney has decided that now's the time for a mm -hmm. counter offer. Why? Because we have it. You and Stephen may have heard that, and this is the part that gets a little irritated, mm -hmm. because if you and Stephen are in on the calls, we're not. So you're not passing the information on to the board members. So where does it say? Where does Brandon Moss say now's the time for a counter offer, and here's why? I believe that it, one of his letters to the board included that, and that's why you have total option to speak to Brandon at any period of time if you're questioning about the timing of the counter mm -hmm. offer. And that's why it's recommended that you not only speak to the experts this week, but you also speak to Brandon about the process going forward. If on Wednesday this board decides, as a board, they're not going to do a counter offer, a counter offer will not be done. This board will make the final decision on whether we're going to present a counter offer or not. For us to argue before everyone on this board has had a chance to talk about to the experts and talk to the attorney, I, I'm just describing the process on where mm -hmm. we're going forward. Yeah. Yeah. I want to take a different approach here a little bit because I'm getting personally a little frustrated here that my sense is that that you know the, the analogy would be the, the the you know the the engines going on the train and and we're starting to see steam and it's about to pull out of the station and we're still standing on the 
on, on the platform. And by that I mean we've got eight surrounding communities, and I believe five <coughs> of them have signed agreements now with, with MGM. And I think that although we're not obligated to do so, we're certainly obligated, and it's not obligated, but it's in our best interest to talk to MGM. And so far we've listened and haven't talked. And I think there's any negotiation that goes by, it, whether our attorneys recommend it or not, the way you negotiate is you get two opposing positions and you work toward a, an agreement that in the end no, neither, neither party likes but they can both live with, which is, the, which is, is what the agreement is. And, and personally I'm not convinced that we need to have every I dotted and every T crossed. I said weeks and weeks ago, if not mo months ago, that I'm not convinced that, that the traffic study is all that, that critical to us being able to establish where we want to be for, for, for mitigation. I've done some work. I think other people on the board have done some work and tried to come up with our own ideas of what numbers are. I know we've had a, a variety of people doing this, and we're, we continue to be in a position, Marie, where we're, we're as, as Alex said, we're waiting. You know, I'm sick of waiting. I think we need to do something because if we don't do something, this train will leave, and, and we need to be on board. We need to be communicating and, and negotiating with MGM. We don't need to force a settlement or, or agree to something that's not, not to our satisfaction, but we need to be talking, and right now we're just listening. And, you know, I don't know how to go about talking other than, you know, and I think we should have done this some time ago, and I'd suggested this and got no, nobody else going for it, was, you know, I think we should each be talking to our attorney and saying, you know, and, and here, you know, if, if Richard wants seven and, and, and Alex wants six and you want six and I want five and Paul wants eight, the attorney puts it all together and says, you know, if I get six, I got three out of five votes. And that's what they're gonna, they're, they ought to be doing by talking to each one of us, and we need to be giving them that number. That, you know, we, we will not get an agreement that everyone on this board likes. I mean, that's the nature of, of this board. We've got a collective, uh, you know, conscience of, of the town here. We need to move forward. And, and I, I no longer want to wait for every I to be dotted and T crossed. If we wait for every piece of information from every expert, we'll be here next year this time still waiting, and the train will have left the station. We have got to communicate to our attorneys. We've got to tell them what we want and set them to, to start discussing with MGM so we can either find out there's a middle ground that we can agree to or find out there's not a middle ground that we, we can agree to and then move forward from there. But right now, we haven't even gotten there. But can I just add, again, this feels like a rush. I mean, MGM withheld traffic data until the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So that effectively meant that we didn't even get the raw data until December 2nd. And then they're pounding on us to say, we want a counteroffer. What they did, that's on them. But why did we represent that we would be making a counteroffer this week? I mean, I guess because I, I'm sure we never decided that. I mean, that may be a good idea. I'm still wait. I'm, I'm, I, I want to review the uh, ex draft expert reports. I want to see MGM's report. I don't know why. I, it baffles me why uh, people enter into agreements not even seeing MGM's report. I mean, that, that needs to be reviewed as well. Um, but why, why was it that we represented this when we hadn't decided it? I mean, that's a pretty critical point in the negotiations. And, and we were pretty specific about what was authorized and what was not. Marie, if I could, yeah. I, Alex, two things. One is, I, I think that, to my mind, when we said negotiation, I think of negotiation as offer, counter offer, response, 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 until you get to a middle. So, all the, you know, from day one, I thought that that we were going to negotiate with MGM in good faith, and we all said we wanted to negotiate in good faith with MGM. And to me, that. That's how a negotiation goes. It's not, give me your best offer, MGM. Give me your best, give me another one, give me another, give, you know. And, and they're, they're, they're clearly a corporation who's not going to negotiate against themselves. They're going to negotiate against us, but then we've got to give them a counteroffer. And, and so to me, 
it was implied in the fact that we hired somebody to negotiate a mitigation settlement with MGM. So I, I'd answer it that way. The, the second thing is But it that didn't answer my question of when we decided that or why, why that I, representation I think that was, implicit was made. When we hired a, a, an attorney and said we're going to negotiate a mitigation settlement is when we decided that, that we were going to negotiate. And then why did we go through these specific discussions about what could be said and what couldn't be said Beats the and, daylights that, out and, of me. and that then to put out something as significant as you'll get a counteroffer next week uh, it beats the I daylights mean, out of me i the other thing i'd like to just uh, comment about is yes the traffic study came late but you know the traffic study no that wasn't even the study that was traffic data. data right the traffic data you know but somehow five towns around here have settled and they didn't care too much about the traffic study and i got to believe that the traffic study no matter what extreme it came out to be, the traffic data was what it was, but the study, no matter what extreme, isn't going to significantly influence the way that <laughs> MGM is negotiating on this, because we've seen that. You know, they've said to us, I believe, you know, if you, or, or at least we've said internally or heard our attorney say, if you're going to negotiate, you better have a basis for your negotiation. We keep saying, we want to get the data, we want to get the reports from our from our consultants so we have a basis for negotiating. There's been five settlements reached with zero basis for negotiation. They're literally pulling numbers out of thin air. $75,000 MGM is. $75,000 for Ludlow and $100,000 right. for Agro. And they're pulling it out of thin air. You know, so if they can pull numbers out of thin air, so can we. You know, and go back and renegotiate with numbers out of thin air. Now, you know, when you go and say, well, it won't stand up in arbitration, what makes you think their numbers will stand up in arbitration? They're pulling them out of thin air. And so, you know, the point that we're waiting for every data, we're waiting for every, you know, every I dotted and T cross before we negotiate, to me, is, is literally not doing ourselves any, any good. We can go in there with numbers that we can personally justify, that we can personally think is, is valid, because those are the numbers that they're no better, no worse than the numbers MGM has generated, and, and apparently other towns have gr grabbed onto, right or wrong. And I'm but, not saying they're but right. we're not waiting for every I and T. I'm waiting for the first piece of information besides the PowerPoint that we got. You're going to get that tomorrow, and okay. you will be able to talk to everybody, and then we'll be able to have a discussion on Wednesday in which it's based in this information rather than... Uh, but you know, Maria, but are we gonna, but, but are we gonna talk about those those numbers in terms of dollars and cents? Yes, because a mitigation yes. is a dollars and exactly. cents. Exactly. We're gonna do that in open session. A, what the That's recommend a great negotiation by telling our the, the other side what we we're gonna do. We gave two possibilities on how to do it. And the third possibility is open session. And one is that you give your number to to Brandon and say after listening to the experts, talking to the experts, looking at the various agreements, this is what my number is. And then he is going to come back with a recommendation on where we're going with the counter offer. And then if this board decides they're going to vote down that recommendation and the counter offer, that is their choice. If they're going to go forward and actually make a counter offer in negotiations, and I agree with Mark, if you don't counter offer, you don't put something out there, then there's, there's no good faith negotiations. We can't slow walk this anymore. If you feel you don't have slow the information, yes, walking. no, we are too at this point. We get the information on oh. Tuesday, and you feel you don't have enough information, then you bring that out. But to say, oh, well, I'm not going to have enough information, we don't know till we see. So let's, well, let's we're in the middle of the process. Let's start the process this? tomorrow. I don't believe it is a rush. We'll it, have the process tomorrow. If after speaking to your experts, after speaking to our attorney, we feel you feel you can't do that, then that's your choice. If Mark feels he can do it, if Richard feels he can't do it, all of us will come to a deliberation and we will talk on Wednesday when the um, recommendation is made by our attorney and I, I think anything discussing before then is just uh, guessing on where we're going to be in the process. Paul? Uh, you know I, I, I don't know why we're rewriting history here because we were told first of all I can't find an email from Brandon the only thing I see from him that said a, a counter offer at some point I don't see in any of his recent emails we need to do one this week or whatever. So to clarify that, I don't see it. If you have it, please send it to me because I didn't get his email saying we need to counter offer this week or soon or whatever. All I saw is one that said at some point. 
We were told by MGM there was an initial phone call you and I were on with Stephen and our attorneys. And what they said was, we're not going to give you any money until you actually have your, your offer, your information grounded in facts. Correct? That's what MGM That's told us. Okay, they, so, they, yes. Grounded yes. in facts. Yeah. We were told there is no money unless you can ground it in facts that the, the, um, uh, the impact to the town, negative impact to the town of Long Meadow. Mm -hmm. So we hired an attorney or firm mm -hmm. and that firm is doing all the research they've initially they reached mm -hmm. out to MGM and we got the same offer every other community did a fifty thousand dollars and look backs and all this other stuff then we were told to counter MGM to truly counter MGM we needed experts and we needed a traffic expert and we needed a municipal expert mm -hmm. and we needed those experts to put a dollar value on the negative impact to the town of Long Meadow and it was supposedly going to be based on those 16 mm -hmm. things that we had nailed down at mm -hmm. Greenwood Center. So we have our experts in which we don't have a report yet. So I don't know. This is where I'm going with the rewrite of history is that what does it matter what I want as a number or Mark or anybody else on this board? Because our experts were supposed to come back and tell us based on their research with our attorney this is the number we need to shoot for. And that's for. why you're speaking with them tomorrow. No, that is absolutely the wrong way to do it because what do they care? They shouldn't care what I think. They, they were supposed to be, we're paying okay. them money because... Then they will be glad to skip speaking to you no. and they'll speak to our then we paid Then we hired people foolishly then because if it all that matters is what I think or Mark thinks or anybody else on this board, then we just wasted tens of thousands of dollars on consultants. No, if you would... I'd be very happy to have the consultants talk to Brandon and come out with an offer and they will skip and they will present that on Wednesday. That's this what we board, Isn't that what we've been waiting for? Yes, as opposed but my to, understanding so how is, is this board wants to read reports, wants to peek under the curtains, and they want to be involved. If you would prefer not to. You said to we talk, want to read reports. What's, yeah. what's wrong with that? Then I'd be glad to have the, the attorneys work with the whole team and they'll come up with it and make a presentation to us Wednesday. And you don't need to call into the well, experts. I, I mean, just, wait a minute. You guys got, someone else has got to speak up on this because that is what we paid for. That's right. fine with me. Can I, can I mm -hmm. just ask a question or, or a question slash comment? Um, I don't disagree with you that it's somewhat confusing and frustrating and seems like a different deal than we said we were going to be on. And the only thing I'd say is we have what's happening in here in this room. And then there's what's happening out there with the other communities, at the Gaming Commission, with forces beyond our control. And we have been tracking all of that as have our attorneys. And some of the change in approach and in timeline and in other situations are driven by those factors out there beyond our control, if, it, I guess it's up to the board to decide how much it wants those factors to influence what's happening in this room, but our attorneys are advising us how the board should do its, do what it's going to do about this based on some of those outside factors. Okay, and show me and in the emails I, where, I, no, just show me where with, that no, is. In, it's, uh, and honestly, We've gotten, you all have gotten so much email, so many emails and so much information from our attorneys. I think it speaks to how involved the select board has been in this process the whole way, way along. But it's a PDF attachment from, I think, not last week's meeting, but the week before his meeting and his report on it. And it did not have a timeline, but it did say a next step is developing a um, counter proposal, which means until you do it, it's the thing you're supposed to be doing when it's a next step. And so the, the other thing I'll say is, I guess, and here's the question, I don't understand, what is the objection to having um, our attorney, myself, and the chair negotiate the deal to bring it forward? Because the stumbling block here is being able to actually exchange numbers, do that process you described, Mark. It's hard to do it in this environment. She, uh, Marie, myself, and the attorneys have been involved in every f segment of this process. We've been in this room for every single conversation. I, what is the objection to just letting us go and, you know, take the ball over the goal line and then bring it back for the uh, select board to consider? I don't have. A, I have an objection to the fact that what we said was we're going to hire experts to come back with information to this board. Mm -hmm. And we haven't seen it, and yet, but no, no, hold on, hold on. And now we don't have the information, but yet we have to do a counter offer. So we don't even know what the experts have come up with as a board. No one here on this board knows what what Parsons Brinkerhoff or 
Is it MRI that, that have what they have produced? Not one of us here has seen that. And yet we want to decide on a counteroffer within a day without seeing information that we paid for that we said we needed. On the other, on, on the, on the other point, Stephen, I didn't think that this board said we want to negotiate a deal in relationship to what the other communities are saying. And I understand your point. There might be a train getting away, but I thought we had Brandon Moss here at one of the meetings. He said, you're really not preparing. If you can't come to an agreement on the surrounding community, you're preparing for arbitration. And this board voted to hire that firm based on their experience in arbitration. I still don't know what we're arguing about. Tomorrow we're going to get the information and we will decide Wednesday if there's a counter offer. What we we're arguing about is you're saying we got to give them our numbers. I, no, do, I don't, wanna, I I don't care what our numbers are. I want to see what they said. That's mm -hmm. what we paid for. And, and, we, and no one is expecting a counter offer gets made prior to the board getting that information and processing it. And if, and if I communicate that, then I apologize and because the, the whole. The whole the whole playbook here has been set on getting the information, and I, I admit the timeline has not been great. <clears throat> and I don't think there's no expect there's no I shouldn't say expectation there's no requirement that we reach an agreement by the end of the year like has been proposed. We know that, but we feel on the advice of our council and in good in good faith negotiation best practice that if MGM continues ha has made offers to us, it's incumbent upon us to make a counter proposal to show that we are working in good faith as soon as we are prepared to make that counterproposal. And we have not, uh, the chair, myself, the attorneys have not asked the board to make that counterproposal yet without being prepared. Our whole goal, everything we've been spending all our time on has been to prepare the board to make that, to be able to, to draft a counterproposal, um, which I understand is difficult to do in open session, which I said, again, we, there, there are ways to, to not do, to, to have it be a little more efficient. Um, and I, like I said, Paul, I think the end game, if you will, or the the end part of this is arbitration. And it's those factors happening outside of this room that I think will most, uh, most impactfully inform arbitration judgments based on what I heard the, the Gaming Commission say today when they discussed arbitration and their guidelines that they're developing for arbitration that I think, to me, should influence how we go about coming up with a counterproposal and how we consider what we want to do for the town of Longmeadow. The board can make that decision on its own. Yes. Uh, the concern I had, I mean, we've been waiting for months to get this information, and then to have to turn it around in a day is really rushed. I mean, this is... You know, and then the, vote against it on it, Wednesday. Well, can, can I finish? Yeah. I mean, this is what I was talking about at the beginning of September. I saw this day coming. I didn't want this day to come where we, we'd be scrunched in. MGM is pushing us while we're not prepared. That's why I was saying we really needed to have expert reports on November 1st so that we were ready to negotiate when they were ready, which was in November. Now, I was assured repeatedly, there's time, there's time, there's time. I pose the question, if I'm, if I'm wrong, then what's the harm in it? We're prepared early. Again, delay, delay, delay. But uh, for us to rush into a counteroffer, I think, compounds the original mistake of that delay. And, um, you know, and to make this counteroffer is like, we've got to do it, we've got to do it. That is MGM's game, okay? They slow walked the information to us. They, they, they delayed PVPC's um, report. PVPC's traffic engineer could, we, we heard about it, it was limited in scope. Why? Because it was, they didn't have much time. Again, that's their decision. We can't control what MGM does, but we can tr control what we do. And we, and all I'm saying is, of course, we have to counteroffer, but the question is when and when we're ready. And for, for me to say, look, you're going to get MGM's MEPA report tomorrow, that we're going to get draft reports tomorrow, you're going to talk to your experts tomorrow, and then all of a sudden we need a counteroffer, which, by <coughs> the way, I think you need a whole different structure to this because the structure of the, the of the offer that they've made is all wrong for us. 
I mean, that's a lot of stuff to cram into one day, and I don't think it serves us well. And I disagree with your characterization about this could have been done in uh, September, October, November. I also disagree with your characterization that they have uh, withheld information and they slow walk the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. This has been a very cumbersome. Wait a minute, right, you're no, I from GM? No, I'm telling you, your characterization is wrong. This has been an MGM extremely. Did not no, they did not. This has been extremely cumbersome uh, process going forward. And probably the part of the problem with the, this process. <laughs> is Mass Gaming Commission and the way they've set it up and the decisions they make going forward. In the middle of this whole process, MGM decided to back off with its original uh, plan to be on the data. They said there's no way we're going to get this data. There's way, no way this data is going to be clear enough. There's no way we can clearly say what the impacts are going to be no matter how long we wait. And they did not want to wait any further. And that's why they're looking at the look back. I do not believe the 100% look back is the right way to go. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission said it was not the right way to go. We're now in the middle of a hybrid. If after speaking to our experts, after speaking to our attorney, you feel it's not right on Wednesday to make a counter offer, that is a choice everyone on this board can make. But we are in the middle of the process. We're not going to stop the process. I want us to move forward and start the deliberation on Wednesday. We have hired an attorney. Our attorney's going to come up, and he's going to say what the a counter offer should be. Maybe he's going to decide the counter offer is something they're never going to accept and we're going to end up in arbitration. Maybe it's going to be a hybrid ver version. Let's wait and hear what our experts have to say before we see if we disagree because we might all be on the same page. And instead of looking back and saying, I wish we could have done this better, we have to say, where are we today? How are we going to handle this tomorrow? And where is our decision making going to be? But on the bottom line is, it's never going to be clean. It's never going to be easy. And once we have that agreement, Mass Gaming Commission could turn around and flip everything around on us again. But wait a minute. You just said MGM did not slow walk this, but the board is slow walking it. How is that possible? No. If no, that's what you said. Oh, yes. I said we're not going to slow walk this now. We're going to talk to our experts. We're going to speak to our attorney, and we're going to make a decision. The decision might be not to make the counteroffer on Wednesday, but to say we're not going to talk and, and start deliberating on this this week. I think there's no reason reason for us to delay that because we do have stuff we're going to have in front of us and we should start talking Wednesday Thursday and Friday and then decide on the board where we're going to be the question is what are we going to do with these expert reports that we commissioned who are working for the town are we going to read them and say no 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 you're wrong or and and therefore they need to be rewritten or are we going to look at those and say Aha, you've helped me frame my thought process of where we ought to be. Or are we going to say, you did a really good job, but you didn't consider some things that I was thinking about or some things that were on our list from the Greenwood School, and why didn't you include those? Or why didn't you? Or so I think it's important, Alex, to your point of how long is it going to take us to digest these reports to what do we intend to do with these reports? Because for some of us, I think it's to frame our understanding of the impact. For others, it may be to look for any significant omissions or, or, or what I'll say, local issues that we're aware of that they may not have picked up on. Which but is, I think, something that you s had suggested <coughs> at a previous meeting. Yeah. Correct. And, and, but I don't believe that, that that's going to be uh, a significant amount of time commitment because I may go there and say, well, I like your number of X, but you missed Y, and so I'm going to go talk to the attorney and tell him it's X plus Y because, and I, you know, and I hadn't considered some of the components that you had to put into X. So you did help me frame it, and, I, you know, I, I can see some things you didn't include because I don't think we're going to go back and say, so I want you to rewrite this report with all the things that the five of us indicated. But so I think that before we say, you know, it's going to take us a, a, a long time or an excessive amount of time to, to digest the reports, I think we've got to understand I mean, what these are drafts. we to get out of them. I mean, these are only drafts, right? I mean, these are very short, well, I th I think sort of back of the envelope type mm -hmm. things. But they're drafts with the intent of, A, helping us frame it, but B, letting us know here are the elements we use to come up with the number. I mean, if, if it doesn't say we looked at 
you know, 13 of the 15 elements and the two we didn't look at was because they didn't have any impact at all and we could see that, that's good enough. But if it just doesn't say that, we're going to want to know why they didn't include them. Right. I assume, Stephen, that that's what's going to, we're going to get out of this. I, I guess, Mark, and I, and I think, I, and I, I don't know if that was rhetorical or, or, or I could offer my, uh, some input on that. Either. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think what I would say is that First of all, I think the the thing is the like I said the the the, the landscape in terms that and landscape we sit today in terms of the surrounding community agreement process and the broader context of the gaming commission and the other communities around us is substantially different than it was even 60 days ago when we were engaging these experts for the first time and I I hope we can all at least agree that 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 factors have kind of changed since we started this process so. Even our own mission with regards to these experts has um, been modified somewhat other than what do, what do we think the impacts are going to be on the town of Long Meadow? That's still been the overriding question. And I think the expert reports will be able to paint that picture um, in, in certain areas for the board. What we do with that information then becomes... I think it becomes in the context of what is a what was a counter proposal going to look like from us, and ultimately, I mean the the, rec the 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 agreements that have been signed are a matter of public record now, and by and large they are financial agreements. So it becomes then the board's and or the our the town government's responsibility to then take those impacts that we think and decide what are they worth in terms of a financial settlement with MGM. That's it's pretty simple. That's where this is all but, going but the, towards. But this is kind of complicated because I haven't seen anything about the, what the impacts are going to be. And then there's an added step of quantifying, uh, 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 well, actually there's a second step of identifying how to address those impacts, and then a third step of quantifying mm -hmm those remedial measures. I mean, to me, that's a lot of analysis and a lot of data and a lot of facts. Well, the impacts were laid out, I think, very well by GPI in that presentation that, that we showed. You're please don't tell me you're talking about the PowerPoint. Yes. I mean, the, there was one slide that was devoted to Longmeadow. Okay, if, if we're relying well, upon that, we, not we, really, it, with a few phrases, uh, I, I, I hope that's not what we're hanging our hat on. Well, why, instead of worrying about what it is, let's wait till you've talked mm -hmm. to our sure. experts tomorrow. Wait till you see the reports before we decide that they're inadequate. And so I really feel that we're, t we're jumping way ahead when all I'm doing is laying out the process of where we're going this week. And the process is the meetings are beginning tomorrow. Open 100% access is being available for as long as you want to talk to the experts, to, for demanding more information, rejecting what has been presented, and then Brandon is going to take all of this and come up with what he feels the counter offer, which this board can then reject. But we are in a process, and I don't think if you feel after speaking to the experts, after speaking to Brandon, that the process is wrong and it's rushed, then we will discuss that on Wednesday. But to say that now till we're not there, I think is jumping the gun. So let's just move through the process and decide if we come out at the other end or if we don't. And we'll have a better understanding by Wednesday. And that's why I have meetings for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Maybe Wednesday night you'll all decide this is the offer, we're happy, or we're never going to come to an offer, all the rest of the meetings are canceled. Okay. But let's move so, down the so line. Again, but my question was originally about the meetings is if we backtrack this. Today's, it's Monday night. Yeah. Okay. We don't have a report in the hand from our experts or from our attorney to consolidate that report and say, based on what we talked about, here's what we recommend. Based on those points you came up with, Greenwood Center, the and the and what the experts did, this is the mitigation of what we think the what we should go for. So we don't have that. We might have it tomorrow. Hopefully, we have it tomorrow. So mm -hmm. sometime during the day, while we're working, we're going to get a report in our hand that says, here's what you what you should mitigate or go for. So sometime between that and Wednesday night. We're supposed to talk to the experts, mm -hmm. come up with a counter proposal. How? No, no. We, 
if you, you have said. an idea, talk to Brandon about your opinion. Mark might have an opinion. You might feel you don't have one. If And then we will come up and we will start deliberating, discussing. I don't care if it's an open session or not. At this point, we have just have to start talking as a, a select board. Okay, wait, decisions. let me finish because you, you said we don't jump the gun. I think you're the one jumping the gun by saying we're coming up with a counteroffer this week. And everything that we've done has been on MGM's timeline. And I understand things have changed. The only thing that's changed is politically, other towns have settled instead of spending money. That's what's changed. Politically, other towns have settled. I, I, I don't believe that's the equation, though. Yeah. No, it's political. I don't they, believe, they have said, no. look, we don't want to spend money. Let's yeah. take the settlement. It makes sense for us. We don't have to, we don't have to go you, through the aggravation. If that's you, a political decision. If we were on MGM's timeline, we would have prepared a counterproposal two weeks ago. Exactly. If we have waited until well, we're we sticking on what up basis? for us. No, no, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. No, I'm just saying we're not on MGM's timeline. So, so, so let's just go back. It, it is, it's a political decision by the other select boards to say let's settle or city councils or whatever. That's a political decision they made. Let's not spend the money. Let's just give in and get the money that MGM's offered. I get it. They decided not to spend any money or ten grand or whatever, and they traded that ten grand for fifty thousand or whatever. Look back. Mm -hmm. Whatever. So. We have been waiting, literally waiting, for this report by our two experts, which was waiting on the traffic because, quite frankly, in the meeting, I think there were three of us there. I think it was Richard Marie and myself. Um, our expert said we need that data from MGM, the traffic study, to do our analysis. Correct, Richard? Was I? Was I? Okay. So that data that we needed was just released to them, and I think it was our, our MRI expert that said, actually, I like to have six or eight weeks to digest this, not six days. But we said we don't. You don't have that time. So realistically, he said he's had to squash it. So we don't have that in hand, but yet, so I thought, again, I'm going back to the original idea that hiring an attorney and experts was to come up and say, here's your dollar amount. We've already sat down as a board and said, here's the impacts we think is gonna happen in the town of Longmeadow. And I'm hoping for the money that we're paying, that we're gonna get something back in our hand that says, this is what your settlement should look like. And that's Whether what it's t well, but that's not what you're talking about, Marie. I'm not asking to sit down and talk to the attorneys. I want to know what they say. I don't want to. I don't. My what I feel is the impact to Longmeadow might not be the same as Richards, and that's not the way you you sit down and talk. We hired people to tell us what the impact was, so and we wouldn't have to have this discussion. That's right. I'm sure that's Brandon will tell I'm, you I'm what he feels that between I'm the confused. experts. Why and do I have to talk to him? Then I don't. want to see the report. Uh, everyone on this board has a different opinion on how they want it to handle, and I'm not going to block the door and say, don't bother calling our experts. They're handling this. If you don't want to, if you feel that it should be in the hands of Brandon and the experts, I'm fine with that. Uh, we'll go with that. Right now, the process is if you want to call, you want input, you want to ask questions, you can. If you don't want to and you want to leave that, and if he feels after speaking to the experts, he's not going to give it. There's no guarantee we're going to give an offer on Wednesday. This is a process we're moving through, and everyone can handle it the way they feel comfortable handling it. And we'll deliberate on Wednesday if we're going to accept the recommendations. Go ahead. Richard hasn't said anything. Oh, Richard. I'm sorry. <laughs> I needed to bring a little lightness to the meeting. I think we need one of those cascade kitchen coaches here. Um, you've not seen the commercial? No. Oh, okay. Uh, I want to change gears. I, th we've had the same discussion that everybody's repeated. I think we all know each other's points. But I had a question uh, on the timing. If we do not, what is our drop dead date to have this settlement to MGM? Sometime. Um, well, and like I said, I think I appreciate asking that because it seemed like the dialogue had gotten to a level where it was almost like we were referring to settling with MGM versus simply generating a counter proposal. Right. Um, like I said, the only reason the only reason we want to generate a counter proposal this week is because they've made three proposals and we've made none, and we feel that, and I think, best like I said, good negotiate good faith negotiating best practices would dictate that you should make a counter proposal. But our settlement date to have is finally done voluntarily mm -hmm. would be either 30 days after they submit their application, or. Uh, if they designate us, if they say Long Meadow, you're a surrounding community, but we don't have an agreement, <coughs> or if they say Long Meadow, you're not a surrounding community in their application, 10 days to appeal or to file a petition with the Gaming Commission, mm -hmm. 30 days after the Commission's ruling to, to voluntarily negotiate. Okay, so, so legally right now we can delay two or three weeks if we had to. Settling, sure. Yeah. I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's good form to well, delay no, I, I, making counter proposals. I agree with you on the on the form, and that could weigh against us to the gaming commission. 
it could look like we're not a willing partner. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the legality is that we've got plenty of time. But um, and it, it and of course every discussion that's been had, and I agree with everything almost been said that they they have it's been their game, and it's their ball, and it's their field. And I think they have delayed some of the information, and I believe it was their strategy. And I amen on their strategy. It was a good strategy on their part. But we still have time. And we don't need to self-disintegrate as a board over this issue. I, I, I agree with what Paul said. My, ex, my expectations were that the experts were going to come back to us with a financial proposal. Because, I mean, I remember asking the one guy, are you going to take into consideration this? And he said, yep, I'll cost it in. So I'd like to see that. I, and I may need, may need more than a couple hours to review it because in the process of review, you're going to have to ask yourself questions and you're going to do a little chat. And so, Marie, I think getting a counter proposal by Thursday may be too quick for the whole satisfaction of the board. Well, let's start the process and see where right. we are. Maybe after speaking to our experts, we will off the Brandon will say this is your number this is what it should be and the board will all agree and we're ready to go with the counter offer okay. maybe the arguments and disagreements will be huge and we won't be able to come to one Wednesday mm -hmm. Thursday I Friday would be prepared, and then we'll move on I would be yeah. prepared for it not to happen Thursday oh, but I think it's a 50 I mean it's a goal mm -hmm. yeah it's a goal we stated I think we stated it's a goal mm -hmm. well, who's the we Brandon has suggested that we come up with a counter. Uh, right. And, I th and what have and we been Brandon, talking about? I found his email. You're right. It was a PDF. And it just said, I suggest the board have a counter offer. Didn't say when. Yeah. It just said, I suggest. That step. was two weeks ago. I, I, I haven't we talked? I mean, it's possible we just haven't talked about it as a board in this environment I, because it's so all consuming for me. I can't even sometimes keep straight which conversations I've had about it with whom. Um, but I certainly thought we were on a plan and laying out in every report I've given what we were building towards, which was this moment of getting this information we've been planning on and using it to inform our decision. And I agree with what Marie just said. Let's get it, see how approachable it is, and if the board just decides we absolutely cannot do this and we, we'd rather risk the appearance of bad faith negotiations than, than rush through this, then okay. Seriously, okay. But let's wait until that happens before we determine we can't possibly do this. Mark? Yeah, Marie, you said something before that kind of concerned me, and I forgot the exact quote, but something that said each select board member should come up with their own, their, their own kinds of proposals, and I, I think. And, and, you know, I'm trying to figure out how we move forward, because clearly what's we're, what we're, we've been talking about isn't doing anything. And, and, I mean, I'm hearing several people say, look, tomorrow or Wednesday, we don't know which day, we're going to get the calculated impact <coughs> from our consultants. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and we paid these folks to do that. We've asked them to do that. They're coming up with the number. I mean, I go back a long time to where, I mean, remember Alex, you saying we should get, we, we should be asking for the money we deserve and not some pull money out of, right. uh, you know. And so why would we not then have the attorney propose to each of us individually a settlement based on, the, based on our consultants' reports? and then let us give individual feedback to the attorney exactly. from that. Mm -hmm. But what that means is that why are we taking the time to discuss with the consultants and to review with the consultants and to second guess the consultants and to talk to the consultants unless it's we believe that they're not doing the job we paid them to do, that they're missing something. And, and you know, I, and, and so if we're taking this period of time, and I don't know if it's eight hours or 48 hours to review the consultant's draft study or draft proposals before we then talk to the attorneys. What is it we hope to do in that 8 to 24 hours if we're already saying that we paid the consultants to come up with a, a factually based proposal? Now, if, if Brandon comes back and says, you know, I think the number should be X, and, and my discussion with him, I can say, that's all well and good, Brandon. But I'm not going to listen to anything different from Y, which may be higher or lower than X. You know, that it may not be based in fact, but at least Brandon will have some fact base. <coughs> I just say, we, for, to have us take 8 to 24 hours or 48 hours or however long it is delay to review the proposals by our consultants, rather than have that go directly to our attorneys to draft something, to me is a 
It, it, there was an interest expressed by board members yeah. to be able to review draft reports with the consultants. That's why we did it and, that way. And I'm yeah. not saying not to review it, but but unless we have some reason to think, Stephen, that we're gonna we know more than they do, <laughs> you know, then what the heck we're gonna do? It's just the tradition of this guessing? board. <laughs> but but to your point, for example, I'd like to know what intersections our traffic expert has looked at. The, there was a, the, the the GPI left out certain incidents. I literally have no idea okay. the can, scope of their but work. But can't we do that in parallel, Alex? So that while the <laughs> consultant's report is going to the attorney to put together uh, what he thinks we ought to be doing, have us also reviewing that consultant's reports. And I'm not saying rush this. I'm just saying no reason to sit on this thing and do things serially when you can do things in parallel. Because clearly, if, if there is a sure. gap in the consultant's reports, <clears throat> we will get that gap addressed. The question is, and we can certainly get it addressed before the final, whether it's counter off or whatever is go to MTM, MGM, but at least the, the, our attorney is putting together something based on, on, on the data we expect to be pretty good from our, our, our paid consultants. And Mark, I think that's sort of what we're looking at. No, we're talking serially, and no, I'm talking I'm parallel. Talk I think that Brandon is going to be speaking to our experts and coming up with a number, and then he, if he, he I was opening up the door for everyone to have a chance to talk to him about where that offer was, but mm -hmm. I believe that Brandon should be making the decision on what the counter offer is. It's just the experience of this board is they really like to get involved in the uh, not only the decision making but the process on how we get there. Uh, and it could be very well that after everything is said and done, this board is not satisfied with the work done by the experts. Uh, uh, maybe anyway, Marie. But it, but it, it, you know, I I think that we ought to have a we ought to review what our attorneys taking to MGM and then ultimately you, when there's a tentative agreement it's got to come back to this board for ratification mm -hmm. and open session. I honestly think Mark, sorry Alex. Well, mm -hmm. What I was going to say is, I mean, <clears throat> I think we're running scared if we're worried that the Gaming Commission is going to think that we're not negotiating in good faith. I mean, MGM, I mean, if MGM wanted to do negotiation now, then it should have been not playing the games that it was playing before. I mean, I mean, and I'm not saying this, I'm, I mean, our attorneys have said this before. We were literally on the edge of going to the Gaming Commission to get the traffic data. I mean, right? I'm not making this mm -hmm. up. I mean, we were willing to say, look, if you don't provide this information, we're going to go and we're going to make the Gaming Commission provide it to you. I mean, that was how serious it was. And so this was all, those were their decisions, okay? And I have no problem as a litigating position to say, look, we had to take a, we had to take a few days to, A, review MGM's own report which I guess came out today, but we haven't seen. Our own reports, a few days after MGM spent all the time misdirecting us and uh, delaying with us. I have no problem with that. I mean, if, if, we're, if we're worried that not responding that quickly is not good faith, then I think well, we're I don't scared. think anyone has ever said that you mm -hmm. have to not have a couple of days <coughs> to do this. I'm saying we start not to review it. Not a couple it. of days. Okay. Like uh, take weeks. Okay. Well, Whatever no, you no, want to no, do is fine. We days. need to start the process, look at it, and mm -hmm. we start discussion on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If you don't come to a decision, fine. We move into the following week. But we're starting the process. And to say that we're rushing it, we're being pushed, we're being manipulated, no. If you do, this board decides they don't want to do it, they want to do it. The experts and Brandon will be coming up. If the, Brandon and the experts feel they have a counter offer, they are going to present it to this <coughs> board, and this board will decide what to do with it. But right now, the only thing is the information's being available. People can speak to the experts. They cannot speak to the experts. They can leave it in Brandon's hands, wait till it comes true with us. No one is being told what to do here. We're laying out the process. And if at the end of reviewing everything, and in two or three days say, I still don't have enough time, I need more time for evaluation, that's fine. That is, everyone can come up with their opinion. So we're just laying out where the process is in the next few days. 
And if you don't make a counteroffer, you don't make a counteroffer. And if we go into January and we end up in arbitration, that's the choice of this board. I don't think that anyone is being rushed or forced into anything. I mean, but, but you, Marie, in all honesty, I mean, that's exactly by having a meeting Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're rushing to get this information we don't have, make a decision on it, ask questions, and then if the board doesn't want to vote on it, then we don't vote on it, and then what? My only, the only point I brought up is what's the end game to the meetings? And if we don't have in our hearing the reports that we paid for and the expectation from those reports of here's what, the, here's what we think, and the, the whole basis of these reports was to bring it back to the board. Let the board digest it. See what they're saying. Because we might be totally... But you're saying, let's discuss it on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Well, come you're up talking with it on, two ways. You're saying this should be left in the hands of our experts. Our experts are going to decide whether they have enough material information to give a counter offer, and they will discuss that with this board in the presentation, and then we'll deliberate on it. When? If, huh? When? When's the we'll, presentation? We'll find out when Brandon's going to give it to us. It so, might be so, Wednesday, Thursday, so, Friday. It might be in three weeks. We were going to wait and see. We're in the middle of the process. If you don't want to meet on Tuesday, don't come in on Tuesday. No, no, no. Don't, 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 Wednesday, don't start giving an attitude because the, the issue, Marie, is if we're going to come in on Tuesday and Wednesday, what are we going to discuss? If we don't have a report and we don't have a recommendation, those reports should come back with a recommendation. Mm -hmm. So so if you want to start saying, well, if you don't want it, don't come in. Mm -hmm. No, I expect to come into it as a board member fully prepared to discuss what we have in our hand. You're going to get something on Tuesday and we're going to have a meeting. Now we're going to cancel it. But yet we can call them and say, I want to come in on Wednesday. If we're going to come in on Wednesday to meet, I want to know what those experts in Brandon say we should be going back to MG. Jam with right. not what do we think and I'm, I'm talking so please don't interrupt my and so what I'm gonna say to you is that if you want to do this the right way you make sure this board's fully prepared because it has it and do I have a problem with you negotiating with Marine attorney absolutely because we haven't been informed this is the least amount of information we have we we're sending the emails you just said Brandon said we need to put a counter offer together it was a generalization of we should come together with a counter offer which is exactly the path we've been taking mm -hmm. get the reports and come in with the counter offer right. So, so to say, don't come in if you don't want to come in. Have the information ready. Have the ready the information ready to have a discussion, because we're coming in with nothing in front of us, and we're going to sit here for two hours and say, well, I read this in the report, I read that in the report. Give us time to digest it, and then have a plan for it. So to say that we're not rushing it, it's exactly what you're doing is rushing it. And you know what? MGM changed the rules. Fine, they settled. But again, we never said as a board that we're going to we want all this information unless MGM settles. Wednesday's meeting will be canceled unless Brandon and the experts have come up with a written proposal for this board, which will be handed out to everyone. If they feel they need more time, then it will go to Thursday. Then if they need more time, it will go to Friday. But you will have it in your email box before Good. we will go forward with the meeting. The meetings are set up in preparation that they might have that available. They might be able to do that. But we will not come in here and just bat around unless we have actual mm -hmm. information. So we will. So the experts will prepare the counter draft counter proposal for the board's review. This yes. is what we're saying. Before we come Perfect. in for an actual meeting. And it's even, I take it, have you seen these reports? No. Okay, so I've seen a draft of the MRI report, report, but I think I'd so, shown so, a draft I mean, of it so to the board. Do you expect that on. these reports? I mean, to me, what's mm -hmm. so striking about how how complicated this is? It's the analysis of the uh, you know looking at the baseline, looking at the impacts, looking at the remedial measures, and quantifying them. I mean, and you think the reports in these few pages. Mm -hmm you've described are going to encompass all of that? I honestly believe, without no, without good. answering the, the specifics of your question in terms of encompassing, I honestly believe, <laughs> just to, to give some not, perspective. Why not answer the specifics? Well, because, I mean, the bottom, questions. because what's the, the bottom line is getting to a counterproposal and then getting to an agreement or preparing for arbitration. But, but, you, just, but you agree please, that all, please? all of that should be part of it, right? Can I finish? Just let me finish. I honestly think the board has spent so much time talking about this and has received so much information previously and has been preparing for this moment no. that I think if, if if any of us each if any of us individually were left our, on our own with a directive from the rest of the board to say, you Alex or you Richard or you Paul or you Mark or you Marie, you do have developed a counter proposal on your own with the attorneys, it could be done in a matter of hours. I honestly believe that we are so far into our thought process and in the information we have and the work that the attorneys have done that it really is not going to take 
I, I, and maybe I've really? just been, maybe I've, I've just been too close to it, but I really don't think it'll take that I long. I literally have no idea what the number should be. I have okay. I, I, I literally well, then, have then, then no maybe, idea but, but because I, I haven't it's, it's seen not as far, it's not factual. as far out there. I don't think it's as far out there as it, I'm certainly getting from well, the conversation. This, excuse me, this is just all supposition. Mm -hmm. We're we're moving forward. We have a process. We have an agreement that this will be in the packet before we even meet on Wednesday, or b Wednesday will be canceled. Thursday or Thursday will be canceled. So uh, we've got the casino update and the process. Can, can I just ask a scheduling question? Scheduling question, yeah. Yes. Um, why are we on 4 o'clock on Friday? Because it's, uh, I wanted to do it before sundown. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, for those of us who work from mm -hmm. 9 to 5 or 5.30, that's not... Mm -hmm the best time. I mean, is there any way, I mean, I think generally we've had these meetings after the end of the work day. I could also move it to noon. Is lunchtime better for you or one o'clock? No. <coughs> I mean, mm -hmm. it, I mean, what's the objection to, to doing it at the normal time? Because some people aren't available. Why don't we s uh, make that decision on okay. Wednesday when we get a better idea after speaking to the experts on how much we need and if we need to push it over to the following Monday on the 23rd? Can I just one quick clarification? Mm -hmm. I really don't want to open this whole thing back up. <laughs> um, will we, and when we get the report, are we going to, is Brandon going to prepare a counteroffer to be presented at the same time that we see these reports coming in too? No, we're Myers. not going to embargo the reports for the preparation of counteroffer. You'll have them in advance, but the directive of having our attorney prepare a counteroffer based on the reports is a new directive. Mm -hmm. So it'll be, I don't know, sequential, concurrent, however you want to look at it. You should, res I, you will be in receipt of the reports, I'm sequential sure. Sequential and concurrent are different. So no, they're either in <laughs> parallel or they're in series. Right, well, all right. And I don't, I don't know which way you're referring to because I, I was harking back to your comment. No, the short of it is we're not holding back on the reports so Brandon can repair the counteroffer. As soon as we get them, you'll get them. And then That's not my question. Yeah, what's I thought that question? was your okay, question. Settle yeah. down. <laughs> no, my question was I like Mark's analogy because I'm an electrician. Series parallel circuits. I, I understand that. You, you like analogies. Mm. Are we going to have the, uh, is Brandon going to review these reports and make his recommendations in addition to us having the material to view early? So is the end result, look, while we're reviewing, like Mark said, is Brandon going to be in the process of putting together what he thinks is collectively a counteroffer? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, yes. yes, that's the directive, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to get the reports as soon as they're available. Did you get Did you get at least three heads shaking up and down when you said, is that the directive? Because unless there's three heads shaking up and down, somebody's going to come back and say, we didn't say that. Perhaps there should be then a vote that's to exactly, direct. That's exactly what we said. So Perhaps the, perhaps there should be a vote <laughs> uh, to say the select board uh, issues a directive to have the attorney prepare a counterproposal based on the reports received from the experts. I mean, that, that's what I heard loud and clear. Is I wrote there that a motion down. to that effect on the motion? In <laughs> parallel to us reviewing the consultant reports. Is that what, I think that's what we and actually did want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are we also contemplating that we would give some input to the attorney? No. Nope. Well, I. No. So, mm -hmm. but we could. Yes. But not, not until after there was a draft sent right. to us by the attorney in my, in my scheme of things Alex. In other words, let it, you know, I, I think it's better always to have, you know, they say a straw model to work off of as opposed to having five people write a document. Let somebody write it and then I, let five I, people I, pull I it apart. I get that, but I mean, w I, I should probably tell you guys, I think the biggest problem with it, I don't know what the number, I'd like to say I have no idea what the number is going to be. The structure of this agreement is all wrong. Because I'll tell you what, whatever number goes into these future payments doesn't really matter if it's structured the way it is, because I guarantee you nobody's going to get a penny. I mean, that, and, and in order to get it so that there could be some future payments, mm -hmm. you're going to have to radically work with that document to change the structure of this agreement. Otherwise, you can just, you know, be happy with what they've guaranteed up front, the guaranteed payments, and you can just count on that being it. 
I mean, that's the sort of input that I think it would be useful for the attorney to hear and uh, for us to deliver. And I think and once I they prepare the counter, you can give them that input. Yeah, I, don't, <coughs> I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with him getting that input prior to him starting the draft. So maybe he'll come back right. to us and say, well, here's a draft in the format of MGM, and here's a draft that I just come, you know, that, that doesn't follow the format of MGM based on some things that you heard from you or Ed Richard or whoever. Anyway, if we're going to go there, I'm going to make a motion that the attorney, our pr attorneys prepare a draft counter proposal to MGM for review by the select board, that draft to be based on the reports of our traffic and municipal uh, consultants. Second. Okay, hold on. Can you, since I'm the note taker. I, yeah, I, got, I, wrote it, I wrote it down <laughs> so I can say okay. exactly. Attorneys. does that too. So I move the go. attorney prepare a draft counter proposal to MGM for review by the select board. Period. That draft proposal is to be based on the reports of our traffic and municipal. You mean draft reports? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, on the draft, draft reports, reports of our traffic and municipal consultants. And it was seconded by Paul. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Let the record show <laughs> that it was a 5 0 vote. Okay. <laughs> having said all that, now Pat, I can pass <laughs> that. The question of Alex brought up of how might we, I'm going to say influence, but how might we? You know, advise the attorney of things that we see positive and we see not positive within a structure of a, of any counter proposal. Can we, should we, and by what means might we communicate that to the attorneys? In other words, if I feel strongly enough about it, can I write a letter to the our attorneys? Can Alex, if he th everybody has been up through this yeah. whole process, everyone has felt open to writing to the attorneys mm -hmm. and uh, picking up the phone. And I, I, I think the best is to write, but I don't think there's anything wrong with picking up the phone and speaking to them either. Uh, I, there's the whole process has been open that way. And can I ask a question? This is for Stephen or for anybody who knows. Mm -hmm. A while ago, I think you, Stephen, you were telling us there was information relating to trip distribution that MGM would not provide. Yes. And where does that stand? They did actually. They did end up. The reason why it was it was proprietary is because it, there are certain. I think it's tied to. And I'm semi speculating. I they they did say this, but I haven't seen it written anywhere. Um, that is based toward, tied to their marketing, like their economic modeling of where right. people are coming from. Yeah, and right. I'm sure that any business has a formula in terms of how they generate their market. Yep. That's somewhat proprietary. So I kind of accepted that since the two were closely linked, there was some loose justification for that. Um, GPI did, in fact, receive that trip distribution model subject to a non-disclosure agreement. Non-disclosure to us? Non-disclosure to, I would say, anyone. I've not read the non-disclosure <laughs> agreement. So, so MGM provided the information to GPI, but we can't get it. Right, and, and it was GPI's okay. role, and, and I did talk to GPI as a follow-up today. Uh, on this, And I learned this today, Alex. I, it, I was not aware of this before. And I said, because I actually asked your question, how important was it to your process that you did not receive the trip distribution study? I think you asked that at the last meeting. Right. And he said, oh, no, we did get it, but it was subject to a non-disclosure agreement. So then I asked... Okay, well, you can't give it to me, but here's what we think. You know, here's what we think the trips coming from Connecticut are going to be. Here's our information that we've seen from MGM and elsewhere. Do you think that information is consistent with what you saw in the trip distribution model? Uh, and they said yes. And it is. it was GPI's job to make those assessments on behalf of the towns that participate in the study. So I, I feel a lot better about that now. Well, we can't. This is, that's awfully sketchy. I mean, uh, I'd like to see it, right? I mean, like, you. I guess I. I'll I tell you that the representation that you just got mm -hmm. 
that will do us no good in an arbitration. No. Well, I, I, you know, I think um, I, GPI, like I said, was not, they were working to review this on behalf of the no, community. I understand, so but what I'm up. saying is your conversation where you say, well, if does that sound basically okay, that's of no value in an arbitration. And that's something we can look at as we, as our attorneys prepare for arbitration mm -hmm. and whether that is going to be an essential element in the arbitration going forward. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep that in mind. Yeah, and I, I do want to reiterate that the commission is developing an arbitration guidebook. I did request a copy. I know it, according to what they said today at the meeting, it was, it's in draft form and legal, I think, internal review. Mm -hmm. I did request a copy from the MGC, okay. nevertheless, to see if we could see, I mean, that's, what are the rules of the game going to be if we don't reach an agreement? I think that should inform our decision-making process. We'll see how far I get. Um, I, they do want to get it out as soon as possible. I did hear that because they know they know. Can be, I get the gaming commission credit, um, although they only spent 13 minutes on it at their meeting today talking about one of the biggest deals for communities that haven't reached agreements. They are aware that communities are under some internal and or external pressure. The slots communities are under extra external pressure. Uh, category one or more <coughs> external internal like deadlines like MGM has given so um, hopefully we can have that in the mix of our decision making soon as well okay I'd like to move on I know that Paul's been waiting and I guess the issue was the financial policy was that it do we want to do the sign first quick too? I don't even know why we have to do that because don't they can't Paul just grant that for t three days or something they only want two days it's beyond three days I think 28th and 29th. No, the 21st and 22nd is when they want to place them. Yeah, so. but they'll probably, I think they place them on the weekend, December 21st, 22nd, to stay up until the 28th or 29th, which is when the sign yeah. is, the sale is. That's how I read it, Paul. They yeah. want it up for that one. Oh, I didn't see that. I just read that they want mm -hmm. them up on the weekend. Uh, I, I, I'm fine. I, I'm going to, you know, I move we approve the signage request by the Knights of Columbus for their ski and, ski and snowboard sale. Second. Second. Number Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Um, and moving on to financial policies. Paul, thank you for your patience. Um, I don't know if this, uh, I had proposed a, a general reserve balance policy. I do not know if that's been put before you. Oh. It's in the packet. It's in the packet. Yeah, it should be right okay. in that KFC thing. Right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, ju I just wanted to make sure. Um, basically, they were uh, in a meeting probably well over a year ago with the auditor. He had, uh, po one of the members of the audit committee had posed a question, what was the, probably the um, major policy that we are missing? And he had answered this general reserve, re general reserve balance policy. Um, it's something that basically would take care of our general reserves as opposed to our policies that we already have in place for water, sewer, capital, things of that nature. Um, it is based upon a couple of different sources that uh, I actually developed it from. It was taken from <clears throat> Standard & Poor's the rating agency um, and it was the, the ranges that I'm proposing standard and poor as identifies a four to eight percent range as categorized as good while an eight to fifteen percent raise is categorized as strong and it's also developed based upon some Massachusetts Department of Revenue analysis that they've done over the years and their recommendation from a statewide benchmark has always been um, anywhere in the in the five to five to ten percent range um, Based upon that, the, the finance committee looked at it. They, they toned down a little of the language. They wanted to make it in layman's terms um, so that people reading it would have a general understanding of, of what they're reading. I hope you folks had a fairly um, easy time reading it. And it is just being recommended for you folks that we include this policy within our general policies um, that we already have on the books. And subsequent to that, I know the Finance Committee has begun working on a capital and debt management policy, just FYI. We'll be working on that, and we've done, we've, uh, they're going to, they have a, a little working group that I'm part of. Uh, we have a target deadline to get that done towards uh, the end of March in order that it be prepared so that 
when we go forward with reporting our FY15 budget on a GFOA kind of standard, part of that standard has policies to be basically outlined and, and given as part of the report that these policies will be in place for the general public to have and read. Um, I just have an idea of how the town is being managed. Any questions, Mark? Yeah, I, I went back and found a policy on our operating uh, stabilization fund, December 8, 2009, mm -hmm. it, that was uh, based on uh, a goal of reaching 4% of the town's operating budget and, and based and it says under MGL, the aggregate amount of stabilization funds shall not exceed 10% of the amount uh, raised in the preceding year by taxation real estate. Expenditure from and transfers into the stabilization fund requires a two-thirds vote of town meeting. It just goes on sources of funds. Right. So how does this, how is this now, this general reserve balance necessary based on us already having that other one? The, the stabilization fund policy is strictly the stabilization fund policy. This general reserve policy is identification of stabilization fund plus free cash. Yeah, so that. that that's the basic difference and going through most of the literature dealing with uh, financial policies related to municipalities as I said standard and pores or the uh, Department of Revenue they combine those two to identify general fund reserves and that's what we're trying to get as general fund reserves so it's the combination of the two whereas the other one again as I said is just identified as a single entity with this stabilization fund only but given the fact that our stabilization fund policy is 4%, and this one's minimum, and this is 5%, then, then actually this is, we're talking about 1% for free cash? I mean, is that? Well, again, given, given the information that's out there today, again, that stabilization fund policy was probably written. It's 2009, it said. 2009, okay, was it reviewed? Okay. Um, again, this is the most up-to-date information I have. Okay, yeah. Uh, the Department of Revenue edition was just out in July when they made the recommendation, and the standard in pours is kind of, you know, again, a rating agency, and um, not that we use them, we use Moody's, but I would assume Moody's has a, has a similar stand, standard for measuring. Okay. I get, just a couple mm -hmm. other things, Marie, if I could. Mm -hmm. that when I read through this proposal, the, there are two trailing paragraphs that are in italics that, that I... Three of them, actually. Uh, yeah, I guess there's three of them. Uh, that I, I, I really don't see them as policy. They're, they're yep. explanation, they're... Call it whatever you want to, but doctrine... That, 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 that is part of the GFOA, to put in layman's terms a number of things, at the re recommendation of the Finance Committee, so people would have a better idea as to you know what free cash is how it's developed again to give them a better sense of, of some of these uh, municipal terminologies I, I just recommend that that be a preamble to the policy and not part of the policy if we're going to do it because it's not that's not policy and if we're stating this as a town's policy it's not the town's policy to preach what free cash that sure. free cash balance is an important indicator of the town's financial condition that may be, but that's not the policy. It should be after it. It's just an explanation, not the policy. Right. Whatever it is, I'd say it's a preamble. It, it defines what it is. Say what you're. Marie, can I ask a question? Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Paul, is the italics is that from the finance committee? It was a recommendation to add to it to give okay. layman's just a better explanation so of these things. Yes. Th this really. And I didn't, free cash is a reserve. I mean, technically, it's not because well, it is a res it is a reserve because <coughs> we it's just excess. Okay, but we're, we're able to appropriate from it. Okay, so that's how it's qualified as a reserve. That right. it's, it's just we can appropriate. Okay, because my comments are, and I had the same thing. I knew I you know I know we had a max by state level, and that we had that policy from two thousand nine. So this just throws free cash into the mix with the stabilization funds in terms of total values for that. Would Right. Recommended range, which is okay. the more common way of looking at it in today's. And I and I agree world. that because I d I disagree that the free cash is an important indicator of the town's financial condition. It just means that 
we either spent less money than we appropriated or we got lucky with some kickbacks but or char uh, not kickbacks but um <laughs> wow, that's maybe. A, maybe that's in the explanation yeah okay immediately um, delete the turn backs i'm sorry turn back <laughs> but it, i don't i don't think i don't think a decline in balance in 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 free cash um is a negative um it means that the town's spending more on an annual basis it might mean that we actually are doing better budgeting in the sense where we've identified some places where there are turnbacks, I mean, because they go, I just, I think that explanation really, uh, especially that first paragraph, really doesn't explain what free cash really is. It's not, it's not an indicator of our of our financial health. It's, I mean, you could have three people retire in a police force and have a mega turnback one year, and the next year there's zero there for a turnback. And I, so I, I have a, a um, and I don't, and I agree with Mark. I don't think that's the policy. It's either the preamble. Or, or an addendum to it. Um, I think the second par paragraph actually describes what free cash is. And, um, I, and again, even the third paragraph, I don't know if we've ever stated that stabilization should maintain the town for two to three years. I think that kind of puts something out there. I know it's, I know that I, you know, it's, it's meant for an emergency, but I'm not even sure I, I like that last paragraph because I think that makes a commitment of what stabilization is is for and it's meant to stabilize the town right but right. for two to three years of a negative i think that also tells people we could have massive spending increases and use stabilization for for the, but anyway my, my issue is with that first paragraph i, I don't think it's accurate um, if we're actually trying to tell people in layman terms what free cash is um, and the other two i agree with mark they should either be a preamble or an addendum to it um, not part of the policy so are we voting today on the um, the non-italic? Because that's where the real policy is. is I, I, I'd, I'd invoke the fact that we've never voted on a policy the first time we've seen it, and I'd mm -hmm. be able to look at this and review it and maybe offer some suggestions and comments and vote on it either at, 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 a, at a subsequent meeting, I think. Having just seen it, just discussed it, I, I wouldn't want to vote on it now. But my question is, the is the policy the non-italic? And that's what we will be approving, and the italic is is that, part that, of it? That seems to be the discussion you're having. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it was offered, um, the italic portion was offered to better or easier describe some other information related to the policy. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't necessarily have to be in there. It was a recommendation of the Finance Committee mm -hmm. um, to take some of this, again, mm -hmm. easier wording type of thing. Okay. And uh, Alex? I, I was just going to say maybe one way of uh, addressing I, I think it is helpful to have layman's terms. What if we just said comment? or explanation background or something like that there Excellent. are other policies that have background and, and that's policy. fine i said mm -hmm. it could be a preamble but it's not the pol that's not mm -hmm. the policy mm -hmm. no. I, um, that's a good paul point. one of the thing key portions of this says free cash once the balance is, budget is balanced and all known deficits accounted for free cash in excess of five hundred thousand dollars will be transferred to the operating stabilization fund I'm not sure I agree with that as a policy, especially because I believe that's currently a policy yeah. in the stabilization fund. That is. That's actually a free cash policy. It, it, it is a yeah. policy. I believe it's already on the book, so this is just reiterating. We actually have that right now. In which policy is that? In? I would assume it's in the operational stabilization fund policy. No, it's not. We have a policy that says oh, anything in excess of a half I a million found gets it. transferred. Mm -hmm. I found it. Or, or if it's not in there, it's in the budget policy. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Maybe it says that for the... It might be operating st no it, it says the target balance at four percent shall be two million dollars but this is the this, the operating stabilization fund not free cash okay, do, are, do, you, do you have the select board the budget policies it, 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 it is a policy that exists that I have been approved and I can look that up okay. for you uh, since I, we're going to be them. voting on it in I'll, the I'm future we'll 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 pull that out and sure and, I, I can identify that. the source mm -hmm. Okay, so we will put that on a um, a future select board meeting. Any other questions for Paul before well, you I, go? I guess my question is, what are we putting on a future select people, board meeting? This is the document? No, people make the comments and, and changes that we're looking to have, and then we will decide whether we'll take the amendments to the changes or just vote this uh, general reserve balance policy. 
And I'd like to make the recommendation that that last paragraph come out of there, especially the line where it says the stabilization balance should be ample enough to, st to withstand two to three years of negative economic impact. I was, again, my, the, my thing with that is that if it's in the policy, then we have a policy of using stabilization for a two to three year period, and it should be part of the explanation, but not part of the policy unless we adopt it as a policy. So maybe if we send our comments to Paul and the Finance Committee. You know what, you know what I'm saying? One, one, we have stabilization. We know what that's used for. Mm -hmm. But by putting that in the policy. Well, again, I thought the two italics or the italics wording was coming out of the policy anyway. Mm -hmm. you would, you'd like to see it off completely if it was called a comment section, well, preamble, or whatever? Yeah, because in the beginning part of this, and that, the part that's not italicized, it doesn't say that stabilization be used for two to three right. years of negative budget. And I think, again, what that does is, you know, we then set up a policy that says we can actually go into budget years with two to three years of a negative. And as a descriptor, I think it's fine as part of the policy inside the policy. I just, the first and third paragraphs concern me as part of, the policy. I think that's all a descriptor that shouldn't just shouldn't be there. But I think the first paragraph's wrong completely. I don't think it's an indicator of our town's financial health. Any other comments for for Paul? Send them in an email. Well, we've got the budget policy. I don't see five hundred thousand. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll find it, Mark. Yeah. I'm sure you will because <laughs> you're, you're always on top. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Thank you. And um, do I have a motion to go to an executive session? Well, I could, I could do a brief town manager report, although the hour, the lights are going to turn off here, and I do want to just give a brief update in executive session. Okay. So okay. I, I don't, and I don't want to make it seem like I haven't reported. Mm -hmm. um, most of the stuff in here is just for informational purposes, not for any, not for anything that's pressing right now. Um, so I guess if this, unless, if there's something that has jumped out at the board that they want to address. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have four or five comments that I think are worth noting for people. One is that there, that we've taken action to collect extra duty, police extra duty pay that we've not been paid in small claims court for that. I think whoever's responsible for doing that, people at home, that's when company X needs a police officer to do something or there's a party or there's a whatever. And what, what happens is we send out the police officer, we pay the overtime, and they promise to pay us. And when they don't pay us, we're stuck with the money, so I'm glad to see we've, we've gone to small claims court to pay it and gotten some judgments. Whether we collect on those judgments, I think, remains to be seen. <laughs> the second one is that I appreciate the, uh, and want to just comment on the status of non-real estate tax revenues and prospects for the current, current fiscal years. And appreciate everybody who went out and bought a new car because apparently that's doing great things for us. Uh, that we received state reimbursement for special elections last year that people questioned that our benefit, veterans benefit payments are increasing well beyond the budget and we're going to be looking for supplemental money to do that. Just because our veterans agent has done such a supreme job increasing the caseload and connecting veterans with benefits, not because point, he... Yeah. Point well taken. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you said that it, yeah. it's a positive thing, not a we blew the budget. It's, it's, it means more veterans are getting what they are supposed to be getting. Yeah. And finally, that the, the CPA money that we are going, that the state is sharing with the town of Longmeadow apparently has increased, and so there will be additional CPA funds available for the town of Longmeadow to do with whatever the CPA... It's for capital planning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's not for capital planning. It's through mm -hmm. the Community Preservation Act, mm -hmm. and it may or may not be capital. Right? I mean, so. no. yeah, and the other one I, sh I should have mentioned was there's a memo uh, in the report from Fire Chief Madison about um, so a local tree company helped them ex uh, facilitate a, a rescue of, a, of another, of a competitor mm -hmm. tree company um, who had gotten s suspended dangling from a branch 40 odd feet up and uh, the chief nominated the tree company um, uh, which is uh, Tree Corp for an, I think a Red Cross no, uh, yeah. yes, Red, Red Cross Hometown Home Heroes Trump. Award, yes. Uh, so that hopefully they'll they will uh, earn that award. I got one mm -hmm. question, uh, Stephen. You put in there the um, the crossing guard report from Captain Stankwitz, and there was a couple of emails that we saw today. Um, and I, it seems like it's gotten a little escalated, perhaps. And is is there an issue that we need to be aware of? I mean, I know 
I read the memo. I understand mm. the issue. Um, you know, on the, on the flip side, crossing guards are important. On the other side, we're paying them right now to sit in their car and sometimes cross people, sometimes not, depending on the intersection. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be a disconnect with our, with the schools as to who's responsible. And, uh, and, and ultimately, everybody's responsible. But, I mean, the, the reality is it's starting to hurt the police budget. At, at some point, is this something that's going to need, like, a reserve fund request, or is it just something that's more you're trying to handle I try, I've been trying to open a I have opened a dialogue with the schools on this because I, you know I, I as the memo show and, and, well let me back up a little bit um, this all kind of I had known this was an issue where it's I think the expectation is that it's the police department's sole responsibility it's never really been my belief but I don't believe it's solely the school's responsibility either I, I just feel like it's you know when it, I think in my interview we talked about you know, the question was, how do you work with the schools better on budget? I said, you start small and work on little things. And I viewed the crossing guards as kind of the next iteration of building maintenance, IT. I guess I looked at this as the next thing I wanted to approach with the, the, the crossing guards. It's kind of a project that we're going to be working on in the budget seasons. Well, I learned a couple of weeks ago, less than a couple of weeks ago, from the police department that, you know, we're, we're having a hard time attracting and retaining crossing guards. It's not... A great job, especially on days like tomorrow. If, we're, if it's down, if, if it's a snowstorm, it, and the kids are walking home, you got to stand out there, and it's not it's not a great job. Most people do it because they feel like it's the right thing to do, not for the money. It's a good job for retirees. <coughs> um, but then you have somebody who is of retirement age out there in all kinds of elements and things like that. And when I looked at through through the so I request a report on what's why are we having a hard time? I think the report lays bare that. <laughs> Compared to other crossing guards, our wages are very low. Um, that the job really isn't great for people who show up. That the pool of candidates you get a lot of times, you know, of course they background check these folks because they're going to be with around our children. A lot of times you have uh, issues being able to find suitable candidates. And then uh, you know, and it did, and it did reveal. That I think some school districts do manage their own crossing guard programs. I mean, if there's no school in session, there are no crossing guards out there. I mean, I think that's the mm -hmm. kind of fundamental thing. Um, I haven't, I've not proposed transferring the program to the school, and I do not propose that now. I think my issue was we need more, we, like everything, we need a, we need to raise the wages on the crossing guards to have the program be more stable if we want to continue with it, and since I felt like that should be a shared responsibility, the, the approach was, during budget discussions and even right now, would the schools be willing to, uh, you know, participate in a cost share? I had intended for that conversation to be kind of a staff-level conversation I had already kind of started. I put in the memo because, as I, my last email, I should have prefaced it by saying this, when we had the situation, the unfortunate situation with Convert, with the kid on the bike getting hit on Converse in Longmeadow, um, you know, the board asked questions that I, I couldn't answer. And I thought, when I saw that, you can't always predict a safety issue. And I said, and when this came up, I thought, this is a predictable one where if something does happen, God forbid, then their questions mm -hmm. are going to be asked. I should get, I should answer and highlight the fact that we have these issues now before something happens. So even if we can't, even though we're trying to move the ball on this and make the program more sustainable, we at least understand that there's an issue. So, um, I certainly did not uh, intend to cause any kind of strife, but it just is. I want to make sure the, the select board was aware that there's an issue with the program because it is a police department program, um, and I just had transmitted that information to the, to the school district, just to, in furtherance of our ongoing dialogue. Okay, and I just wanted to mention it because I want to say first of all, thank you for putting it in here and knowing that before, um, and then seeing the emails today. And I'm, I'm I just and I want to mention because I was a little disheartened by. Um, the chair of the school committee's email to you saying you shouldn't put it in our packet uh, because it's a situation that if we're going to actually handle together we should all probably know about it so I you know if we're going to worry about what inflames the things between the two committees it's not going to be crossing guards it's going to be the budget so you know let's mm -hmm. let's save the fodder for the other things but I just wanted to that's why I wanted to bring it up because I thought that you were right in doing that and I just wanted to I just thought that you know Michael's email was you know saying you shouldn't have told the board about it without 
mm-hmm. uh, us knowing about it. And, I, it. and they did know about it, and you, you did go to them. And um, I mean, I hope it works out and that it, there's something that comes to agreement on it. But I just wanted to, um, you know, back you up on that and let the chair know that of the school committee that we did need to see this today, not two weeks from now or a month from now or when someone got hit by a car at a crossing mm-hmm. guard we didn't have or something. So I just wanted to say thank you for putting it in there and letting us know. Mm-hmm. Any other oh, no, questions? I don't. You want a motion? No, well, also anything else on the town manager reports? No. I move we, mm-hmm. we adjourn to an executive session not to return. Return into open session for the purposes of minute approval and update co- updated on contract negotiation. Second. Okay. Uh, and it has to be a roll call? Um, yes. Yeah. Mr. Foster. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mr. Grant. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Angelides, yeah. Mr. Gold, yes. Mr. Santanello. Yes. Okay. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good night.